practicing the jhanas, traditional concentration meditation as presented by the Vopa Oxido, by Stephen Snyder and Derasmussen, read by Josh Dippold. Chapter 1. History of the Jhanas When the Bodhisattva Siddhartha could no longer resist the inner call of liberation, he left behind his family in the luxury of palace life. Shaving off his hair and beard, he donned the robes of Asama, Asamana, a wandering religious seeker. He went to study with the few select teachers of his day who were accomplished in the concentration practices of jhana, which led to purification of mind. First, Siddhartha went to Alara Kalama, from whom he learned the first material jhana through the seventh immaterial jhana, the base of nothingness. Despite these attainments, Siddhartha continued his pursuit and sought out Udaka Ramaputta to learn and practice the highest attainment of the day, the eighth material, immaterial jhana, the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Completing these attainments was the foundation for the Bodhisattva's path to eventual Buddha. Over the next 40 years, the Buddha gave many public talks, or suttas, which he memorized and orally transmitted from monastic to monastic for hundreds of years. The suttas were then transcribed into writing as the Pali Canon. In many suttas, the Buddha repeatedly encouraged seekers of liberation to take up the practice of jhana. A few hundred years later, Bhadadantacharya Buddhaghosa compiled a detailed meditation manual in the Vasudhi Magga, the path, which describes the specifics of many forms of Buddhist practice, including the jhanas. The story of the jhanas is a long one, so ancient that it predates written history and even Buddhism itself. It is worth knowing, if for no other reason than to demonstrate the durability of his practice over the millennia and its worthiness to remain as a pillar of modern Buddhist practices, not as a supplemental or side practice or something done for fun or for blissful spiritual experiences, but because it has been done through the ages as a foundational method for purifying the mind. As in the old days, many modern Buddhists feel drawn to emulate the meditative path of the Buddha himself. Those of us who see the Buddha not only as a cherished icon, but also as an actual role model for how we should practice, can harbor very little doubt that concentration meditation in the pursuit of jhana is warranted. Some people believe that the demanding requirements of practicing the jhana, according to this and the Vasudhi Magga, make it a lofty goal beyond actual. You may even believe that it's unlikely, if not impossible, to attain the jhanas as described in the instructions outlined in the Vasudhi Magga. Fortunately, we have in our time a meditation master in the person of Venerable Paak Saidao, whose voluminous books on the Buddhist path for its long and distinct have made, made these once obscure teachings more accessible. We believe that with his traditional presentation and the historical basis for jhana practice, coupled with first-hand ex experiential pointers, modern practitioners can undertake this rigorous form of concentration practice and indeed make progress in the purification. For us, one of the primary reasons for undertaking concentration practice was the Buddha's own path. In reading a broad selection of the suttas, you will find that the Buddha mentions jhana over and over. Why was it so important to him? We wanted to find out for ourselves, as do an increasing number of meditators today. At the time of the Buddha, nearly 2,600 years ago, jhana practice was widespread. The young prince Siddhartha first experienced jhana when meditating as a young boy. Quote, I recall once when my father, the Sh 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 Sakyan, was working, and I was sitting in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, then quite withdrawn from sensuality, withdrawn from unskillful mental qualities, I entered and remained in first jhana. When S Siddhartha undertook the ascetic life in search of spiritual awakening, one of the first practices in which he engaged was concentration meditation and the rigorous practice of the jhanas. Throughout his long life, the Buddha cited samatha practice extensively as an essential part of the path of practice. In fact, entering jhana was not only the Buddha's final meditative practice, but also the final action of his life. Quote, then the Blessed One addressed the monks, Now then, monastics, I exhort you, all fabrications are subject to decay. Bring about completion by being heedful. Those were the Tathagata's last word. Then the blessed, blessed one entered the first jhana. 
His final action was to enter each of the jhanas sequentially from the first to the eighth, four material jhanas and four immaterial jhanas. Then he descended from the eighth jhana in reverse order to the first jhana and again entered the first, second, third, and fourth material jhanas. Emerging from the fourth jhana, he immediately was totally unbound. Clearly, the Buddha was a supremely realized meditator. He could have elected to do any of a number of sophisticated spiritual practices at the time of his death. The fact that he entered jhana as his last act speaks strongly to us. Through not only his words but also his actions, the Buddha demonstrated the importance of jhana at every stage of a meditator's practice, all the way through to enlightenment. A number of teachers currently offer concentration meditations. Not surprisingly, these teachings are not all presented in the same way. Although there may be many approaches, this book focuses on concentration practice as referenced in numerous suttas of Buddha and detailed more specifically in the Visuddhimagga as presented by the Venerable Pa'ak Sayadaw of Pa'ak Manas, Myanmar, Burma. Our book is designed to be in conjunction with the Venerable Pa'ak Sayadaw's book, Seeing and Knowing, or actually Knowing and Seeing, which provides very detailed and specific explanations of every step of the practice, the details of which we will not repeat. In this book, we share with you pointers from our direct experience, the experience of two contemporary American practitioners who completed the entire Samatha path, including the eight jhanas and related practices, under the personal and rigorous guidance of the Venerable Pa'ak Sayadaw during a two-month retreat in town, California, in March and April of 2005, we provide an overview of the Samatha practice from its basic beginnings as mindfulness of breathing to its culmination as a doorway to the Vipassana practice. You will find this book relevant if you are interested in Samatha as a daily practice for cultivating serenity and insight. If you are called to understand a more extended period of practice to attempt to access the depth of the material and imperial jhanas, or if you are interested in the further practices of samatha. We've used the term samatha as concentration meditation practice interchangeably. We believe that one reason modern yogis have found these very rigorous jhanas so challenging a practice is because of confusion, confusion about the practical steps that are necessary. We also notice that many people have an underdeveloped conceptual, conceptual understanding of the jhana's purpose and that people sometimes misapply the concentrative meditative. Our aim is to support your understanding of this practice as a purification of mind and do our best to clarify these issues of misunderstanding. In this spirit, we offer this book in gratitude to the Buddhist community for all it has given us as a bridge between modern practitioners and tradition. End of chapter one. Chapter two, Samatha practice, the purification of mind. We would like to begin by setting this chapter in the context of the entire path of practice as outlined by the Buddha and preserved in the Theravada tradition. The path to liberation includes these three stages. Number one, ethical behavior and morality, sila, concentration or serenity, samatha. And three, insight, vipassana. Ethical behavior lies, lays a foundation for the other practice. The majority of this book focuses on the samatha practice, of which the possibility of experience the jhana absorptions is a part. In undertaking concentration practice, you will inevitably encounter hindrances and attachments. All these, although these may seem like obstacles to the practice, working with them actually is the practice when you understand that samatha is designed for purification of mind. How do you know if you're doing the practice? Often you know because you are encountering hindrances. This is, in fact, a common beginning stage of engaging the practice of purifying the mind. Purification of mind can be likened to the clearing of a cloudy glass of water. At first, there are particles of dirt floating throughout the water. For time, with stillness, the particles settle, revealing clear, sparkling, pure glass of water. Vipassana is the third segment of Buddhist teachings. Through Vipassana practice, it is possible to see beyond what is available to the normal sense perceptions. As meditative capacity deepens, the yogi can see directly into the of reality. Preliminary Practices of Sila Whether you are practicing at home or on a retreat, it is essential to develop the wholesome moral ground from which the possibility of jhana exploration can most readily commit. The eight precepts and the five precepts listed below can be considered as training guidelines that support all aspects of spiritual practice. Jhanas are a highly specialized meditative on daily summit to practice and be a wonderful means of cultivating serenity, deepening concentration, 
and beginning to purify the mind. An in-depth exploration of the practice requires a minimum of 10 days to several months on retreat. The Venerable Pa'oxidal requires retreatants to adopt the eight precepts or at a minimum five precepts. Householders are encouraged to adopt a modified version of the five precepts. The precepts are taken as an act of virtue, a wholesomeness of person intention. Wholesomeness provokes, promotes successful anapanasati meditation and the possibility of jhana. Inviting wholesomeness and turning away from unwholesome thoughts and actions is absolutely vital to purifying the mind. If you are too distracted by attraction and inversion, concentration practice is not as productive as it. There are numerous counterproductive actions that appear harmless, but that do distract the old in a way that erodes the practice. Some examples include small amounts of talking, frequently evaluating your practice, obsessing about food. You need to allow the precepts into your deepest level of intention and aspiration. You must honor the spirit and meaning of the precepts as a way of cultivating the ground for concentration. The eight precepts for use on read are... One, I undertake the precept to refrain from harming living creatures. Number two, I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Number three, I undertake the precept to refrain from all sexual activity. Number four, I undertake the precept to refrain from correct speech. Number five, I undertake the precept to refrain from consuming intoxicating drinks and drugs. Number six, I undertake the precept to refrain from eating during the forbidden time, that is, after 12 o'clock noon. Number seven, I undertake the precept to refrain from dancing, singing, listening to music, going to see entertainment, wearing garlands, using purifying the body with cosmetics. Number eight, I undertake the precept to refrain from lying on a high or luxurious seat or sleeping place. The Maga Vivanga Sutta defines refraining from incorrect speech as, quote, abstaining from lying, abstaining from divisive speech, abstaining from abusive speech, abstaining from idle chatter, and Idle chatter, both external and internal, must be silenced during concentration retreat. Meditators usually take the precepts at the beginning of a retreat. To the extent feasible, honoring and applying as many of the precepts as possible prior to the retreat lays a wholesome groundwork for purification of mind as found in the Samatha practice. A wholesome mind seeks and expresses wholesome actions. The precepts can be modified to fit the life of a householder while living a worldly life, as is common with modern practitioners. Undertaking these precepts on an ongoing basis is a practice in itself revealing areas of attachment, aversion in, in your daily life. For example, suppose you apply the first precept to refrain from harming living your day-to-day life. Certainly, there are obvious dietary questions. Should you be a vegetarian? What if your family pet becomes ill with terminal cancer? Do you put your pet down? When insects invade your home, do you exterminate them? What if your country is invaded by hostile forces? Do you support your country's military in defending itself? These are the types of issues that challenge you to engage the precepts and live them more deeply. Living with, conscious, living with consciousness of your deepest intentions cultivates wholesomeness in an ongoing way. So five precepts as used by many modern Buddhists. One, I undertake the precept to refrain from harming living creatures. Number two, I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Number three, I undertake the precept to refrain from harming others through sexual activity. Number four, I undertake the precept to refrain from ex speech. Number five, I undertake the precept to refrain from clouding, from clouding the mind by consuming intoxicating drinks and drugs that lead to carelessness. The Four Noble Truths. The seminal teaching of the Buddha is the Four Noble Truths. Number one, the fact that there is suffering unsatisfaction in life. Number two, the origin of suffering. Number three, the cessation of suffering. And four, the way to achieve cessation of suffering. The Noble Truths are the subject of extensive teaching in Buddha. We refer you to Wapala Rahula's book, What the Buddha Taught, for a more detailed overview of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path than we will hear. To summarize, the unsatisfactoriness that is inevitable in life comes from our attachments, grasping or rejecting what is occurring. We suffer when we desire something in that we do not obtain or receive the desired object, and then either lose it or want more than was received. The origin of suffering is complex. Simply put, it is the belief that the five aggregates, materiality, sensations, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness are, quote unquote. The average person takes the aggregates as an individual me, a separate and distinct self. This imagined identity then seeks to reinforce itself both internally and externally, creating more grasping and attachment. This sense of a me also regards the thoughts as coming from an identity. 
Cessation of suffering is taught by the Buddha is becoming free of this delusion that there is a quote unquote I. We become free by practicing the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path. One, wise view. Two, wise intention. Three, wise speech. Four, wise action. Five, wise livelihood. Six, wise effort. Seven, wise mindfulness. And eight, wise concentration. As with the Four Noble Truths, entire books have written about the Eightfold Path. Since teaching the Eightfold Path is not our purpose, we will not detail it here. However, it is important to note that the Buddha repeatedly defines the last element of the Eightfold Path, wise concentration, as jhana. Samatha Practice Overview The word samatha can be translated as tranquil or serenity. In the samatha practices, our primary task is to focus on one object to the exclusion of everything. In other words, to develop concentration. The Buddha taught more than 40 meditation objects for samatha practice, which are described in detail in the Vasudhimagga. The most widely used of these objects is the natural breath as found in the Anapanasati meditation. Why would we want to focus on a particular object of awareness to the exclusion of all else? Why would the Buddha have designed these practices? When we attempt to focus awareness on a particular object, one of the first things to happen is that we can't do it. The mind keeps going to other things, thoughts of the past or future, distractions in our environment such as sounds or physical discomfort and so on. These difficulties, called hindrances, are described later in this chapter. Undertaking this process is useful because the same hindrances that occur when we are meditating also occur in our everyday lives and ultimately cause us to suffer. This brings us back to the Four Noble Truths, that life inevitably presents us with unsatisfactoriness and that there is no, there is a way to meet these inevitable occurrences without mental suffering. The genius of the Samatha portion of the Buddhist path is that it builds our capacity to focus awareness rather than allowing our awareness to be continually distracted and prone to the causes of suffering. Every time we bring our awareness back to the our object, we are building the muscle of concentration. This can be likened to lifting a 20 pound weight. When we first lift the weight, perhaps we can't do it very well. Maybe we can't lift it all, it all the way, or we can lift it only a few times before we are overcome with fatigue and need to stop. But each time we lift the weight, we build the muscle. With many repetitions over time and with consistency, our capacity increases. Eventually, the 20-pound 20 20 pound weight no longer feels heavy because our capacity has increased, increased so much. In Samatha practice, we build our capacity in the same way. Every single time we realize that our awareness has strayed from our object and we bring our awareness back, we are building our capacity to be free from the suffering of life, both large and small. Let's say we are driving in traffic and someone cuts us off. We have a choice. We can allow our awareness to linger over the incident, rehashing the anger or frustration for five minutes, or with skillful concentration, we can turn away from that distraction and simply let go. Powerful concentration is an antidote to the hindrances, not only on the meditation cushion, but in everyday life. In turn, this concentration and ability to turn away result in a serenity that would not otherwise be possible. Ultimately, when concentration is honed to a laser-like focus, it enables awareness to penetrate beyond the everyday perception of reality. What do we mean by laser-like focus? Settling and stillness accompany deepening concentration. As the mind settles from its habitual chatter, a number of new perceptual capacities can emerge. When the clutter of compulsive thought is cleared away, the light of awareness becomes powerfully bright. This brightness, turned inward in the Samatha practice, allows access to the immaterial realms that a cluttered mind cannot obtain. In Vipassana, when this brightness is turned toward materiality, the physical world, or mentality, thought forms, these can be perceived and experienced in their unconditioned form without the overlay of conceptual conditioned thought. In this way, concentration can enable us to perceive beyond our everyday relative reality to the ultimate reality spoken of in mystical traditions throughout the age. Just as in, just as an actual laser beam which is made of highly coherent light, can penetrate steel, laser-like awareness can penetrate through our conditioned perception of materiality and mentality. And Anapanasati Meditation Instructions 
in undertaking the Anapanasati meditation practice, the Venerable Paaksaido references the Maha Satipatthana Sutta, Diganakaya 22, and gives the following instruction in his book, Knowing and Seeing. We have paraphrased it as follows. Monastics, here in this teaching, a monastic, having gone to the forest or to the foot of a tree or to an empty place, sits down cross-legged and keeps the body erect and establishes mindfulness on the meditative object. Only mindful one breathes in and only mindful one breathes out. Breathing in a long breath, one knows I am breathing in a long breath. Or breathing out a long breath, one knows I am breathing out a long breath. Breathing in a short breath, one knows I am in a short breath. Breathing out a short breath, one knows I am breathing out a short breath. Experiencing the whole body, I breathe in. Thus, one trains oneself and experiencing the whole breath body, I breathe out. Thus, one trains oneself. 4. Calming the breath body, I breathe in. Thus, one trains oneself. Calming the breath body, I breathe out. Thus, one trains oneself. To put this in modern language, we offer the following instructions. Seat yourself in an upright posture with your spine straight, your shoulder blades relaxed down your back towards the floor, and your hands comfortably on your legs and or lap. With eyes closed, allow your attention to be lightly placed where you notice the movement of breath between the nostrils and upper lip. On a pana spot, the object of meditation is the breath. You are to know the breath as it passes the anapana spot on each inhalation and exhalation. When the attention wanders from knowing the breath as it moves across the anapana spot, gently return it without judgment or self-criticism. One method of concentrating awareness is to count breaths. The Sayadaw suggests counting from 1 to 8 and back down from 8 to 1 with each progressive inhalation and exhalation as a unit. For example, a single in-breath and single out-breath is 1. Once concentration begins unifying, you can drop the count if you like. Another method to develop concentrated awareness is to notice the length of the breath, long or short. This is not a mental evaluation, but an aware knowing. It is also not noting, as in associating a word to the knowing. Simply put, the in-breath, you know whether it is long or short. Upon the out-breath, you know whether it is long or short. As with counting, this can be dropped once concentration develops. When you're using the counting or noticing the short and long breaths, it is important that you don't start to take the numbers or the short or long as your object, which can easily happen. Your object is always the breath, and these devices are only temporary aids to help focus awareness. You may find these devices very useful, especially the counting, because it becomes very obvious very very quickly if you've wandered off your object. However, if they are not useful for you, or if at some time they become superfluous, drop them and use the breath by itself. In terms of posture, you can meditate in whatever position is conductive to practice, as long as your spine is straight and preferably upright. For example, meditating on a Zafu, meditation bench or chair are all fine. Find a position in which you don't need to move around much, if at all, that you can maintain over a long period of time. On retreat, if you're meditating long hours and need to vary your posture for more physical reasons, it is occasional, occasionally acceptable to take a lying posture as long as your back and head are elevated, perhaps on pillows. However, this should only be the exception rather than the rule. In our experience, the energy with the spine straight in relation to the earth and cosmos is much more conducive while sitting than reclining. The Anapana Spot The Venerable Paak Sayadaw instructs meditators to know the breath as it enters and leaves the body at the point at or below the nostrils. You should find the point that is most predominant with this general region and use that as an anchor. The specific spot can be anywhere from the upper lip to the entrance of the nostrils, but not inside the nostrils. The entire sequence of inhalation, pause, exhalation, pause, is what is referred to as the whole breath body. As a meditator, you know the entire breath body only at the anapana spot should not follow the breath into or away from the body. Sometimes the most noticeable spot moves slightly from one day to another, which is fine. However, it is best for the spot to be consistent for an entire meditation period rather than varying it within one sitting. 
For many people, as sensitivity increases, their particular Anapana spot becomes a consistent, reliable, and even comforting anchor that can then be used to focus awareness on the breath. With your attention on the breath, crossing the Anapana spot, it is the breath that is the object here, not the skin. The attention is placed on the awareness of the breath as it goes in and out of the nostril. In addition, you should not focus on the breath anywhere else in the body, such as the belly or lungs. This is very important. If you do not follow this instruction, your practice will never progress to the point where the nimitta emerges with the breath at the anapana spot. The nimitta is a light that appears when concentration deepens, the jhana factors gaining strength. Nimitta is discussed in deep chapter 4. As described in chapter 4, this merging is essential for absorption into the first jhana. Without it, first jhana absorption will not happen. The awareness of breath at the anapana spot is not evaluated, judged, or controlled. Breathing naturally is important. Ideally, your attention should never leave this object. During the meditation period, as often as your attention wanders away, it must be brought back to the breath as it passes the specified spot. When your attention wanders or wavers or wanders from the object, gently return it without critique or judgment of any kind. On retreat, even when you are not meditating, your attention should always remain on the breath crossing the anapana spot. With each breath taken, your attention is first and foremost on this object. During every action, whether it be walking, eating, or showering, your attention should be established on the breath crossing the anapana spot. During the night, upon slight waking, place your attention on this object. Immediately upon awaking in the morning, place and sustain your attention on the knowing of the breath of the crosses the anapana spot. If your attention wavers at any time, gently return it to the object. Around this time, the mind settles enough to extend meditation periods up to several hours, fostering a rising of the nimitta. Hindrances. Hindrances draw our awareness away from our object. Ultimately, they are the cause of suffering, both while meditating and in our daily lives. The five hindrances are 1. Sense desire. 2. Ill will slash aversion. 3. Sloth and tor- 4. Restlessness and remorse. 5. Doubt. Sense desire is seeking pleasant experiences through the five senses, touch, taste, smell, sight, and hearing. While meditating, sense desire can take the form of wanting a better meditation, wishing for blissful states to arise, and so on. Rather than being with your object, you begin to suffer because you want something that you don't have. Ill will slash aversion can take many forms, anger or judgment of yourself, others, an event. It can also manifest as dislike and fear. In meditation, this can take the form of finding your nature circumstances, judging your own practice, or even fearing that your sense of me will be threatened by the fruition of your practice. One of the most common forms of aversion that arise while meditating is aversion to physical pain. As with all the hindrances, if pain arises while sitting, do not take pain as an, the object. This is the difference between this practice and the mindfulness practice as taught in the turn of Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw, in which you would turn your awareness towards the pain became predominant. In concentration practice, always stay with the primary object of meditation, which in this case is the breath. You stay with your one object, you're building the muscle of concentration, whereas the Vipassana practice is building the muscle of being with things as they are, as they arise. Sloth is often used to describe sluggishness, where torpor is drowsy mind state. In meditating, torpor frequently appears as sleepiness. If you are generally sleep deprived, sometimes it is best just to take a nap. However, if you've had enough sleep, which tends to be the case on retreat, sloth and torpor often reveal an unconscious reluctance to be with the practice and your situation arising. With wisdom, sloth and torpor can sometimes be seen as a sign of some underlying avoidance. Restlessness is an unsettled mental state. Remorse is the sense of regretting past actions. In sitting, these can appear as restlessness while meditating and as impatience in wanting the sitting to end. Doubt can show itself as distrust, distrust, distrust in the teacher, the teachings, or your ability to meditate properly and effectively. 
With concentration practice in particular, people often have a lot of doubt and uncertainty about their progress as well as their capacity for the practice. In daily practice and on retreat, nearly every meditator will experience one or more of the hindrances. When any of the hindrances arise, you should determine which hindrance is present. Heartfelt compassion for the hindrance in yourself is a vital first step. The skillful use of effort discussed more extensively in Chapter 4 can also be an antidote to the hints in this practice. On retreat helps considerably if you guard the sense doors by keeping your vision mostly downward while fostering compassion and loving kindness for yourself and others. Also, you can develop a kind of love for the meditative object and the timeless deep silence and stillness that are ever present. This depth of silence and the accompanying accepting can are a balm for the outbreak of hindrances. You can take refuge in the pristine silence of the practice. The Venerable Pa'ak Sayadaw instructs students that the five jhanic factors are a wholesome medicine for the five hindrances. As we turn away from the hindrances and towards the jhanic factors, the hindrances recede and the jhana factors increase. Jhana factors. The jhana factors are byproducts of concentration. Usually, we must undertake an intensive period of practice such as a read for them to arise with sufficient strength to be noticeable. Sometimes people get confused, thinking that the jhana factors lead to pleasant emotions as experienced in everyday life. This is a misconception. In actuality, the jhana factors are specific conditions that arise as a result of the mind unifying through purification and the building the muscle of concentration that develops as we turn away from hindrances hour after hour. This is why it can be said that, in a way, the jhana factors replace the hindrances. The five jhana factors are applied attention, it's vitaka, sustained attention, vikara, vikara, joy, pity, bliss, sukha, and one-pointedness, ekagata. Vitaka. Vitaka, which is translated as applied attention, is the initial movement of attention to the meditation object, to the meditative object. For example, when you find your attention has wandered from the breath crossing the anapana spot, gently direct it back. Each time your attention wanders, non-judgmentally return it to the object. Initially, your sole job, if you will, is to apply attention to the object. With many repetitions and a strengthening of concentration, the object eventually becomes more and more stable and you have less need to continually reapply your attention. Until this happens, though, you must be diligent and consistent without being heavy-handed and applying attention to your object. Vikara. Vikara is translated as sustained attention. As your attention stays with the object, its coherence develops through the uninterrupted continuity. When your attention does not wander from the object for 30 minutes, the car becomes even stronger and is more noticeable. In daily life, you attempt to focus on the object primarily during formal sitting practice for however long you sit, but you can also return to it lightly throughout the day while working at the grocery store or before falling asleep in bed at night. Whether on retreat or meditating at home, when you are doing concentration practice, your attention should never waver from the object. It is a kind of love affair with the object, which initially is the breath as it crosses the Anapan spot. Although it, is, although it isn't usually possible in daily practice as a householder, on retreat you should apply your attention to the object and sustain it constantly throughout the day. The car strengthens by maintaining attention on the breath crossing the Anapana spot while in meditative posture, meditation posture, as well as when walking, eating, showering, and moving around. While doing the Anapana meditation practice, before, during, and after each and every inhalation, pause, exhalation, and pause, your attention is on the breath as it crosses the Anapana spot. You never, never, never take your attention off the breath crossing the Anapana spot. Every activity is done while simultaneously placing attention on the object. At some point, Vikara can become so strong that the awareness snaps onto the object and rarely, if it ever, leaves. Think of the metaphor of balancing a spoon on the end of your nose. Throughout every activity of the day and night, you are trying to keep the spoon balanced on your nose. Should the spoon slip off, you place it back on your nose and keep your attention exactly on the spot where the spoon touches your skin. When you can apply your attention to the object and sustain it on the object, the jhanic jhana factors arise naturally. Pity. Pity, which is translated as joy, is a joy that is without specific situational cause because it results from the cohering of the mind. 
we have found the term joy in this case to be a little difficult for some students to differentiate from other pleasant or happy feelings they may experience in everyday life. Pity, as experienced, feels like happiness in the body, although it, it is actually a mentally induced state. Sometimes it is referred to as rapture. Because pity can be so intense in the body, it can actually cause restlessness in some people. This grosser, grosser aspect of pity becomes beneficial as meditators progress through the jhanas because it allows non-attachment to pleasant experiences to gradually emerge. Sukha. Sukha means bliss, but bliss is a tricky word because it has so many meanings and implications. Sukha is best understood as a mentally sensed bliss that is also felt subtly in the body. While pity could be experienced as bodily happiness, sukha can be experienced more like a gentle contentment. Sukha is more settled and refined in its feeling than pit pity. Pity is more excitable in its feeling and somewhat more gross. Again, both are produced mentally. Ekagata, or ekagata, is described as one-pointedness of mind. This mental state is experienced as a focusing of attention and intention as a collecting and unifying of meditative energy. There is an experience of uninterrupted unification with the meditation object, meditative object. Think of a flashlight whose beam of light can be adjusted wider or narrower. When the beam of light is narrowed to the visual width of a pencil and the functioning of a laser, this would be analogous to agagata and concentration practice. The attention is highly coherent, increasingly like a laser beam. In the first jhana, the above five jhana factors are present. However, as the meditator progresses to the fourth jhana, the factor of upekka, equanimity, arises in addition to replace the feeling of sukha, bliss. This is because a feeling, mental state, is present in all the jhanas up through and including the eighth jhana. In the fourth through the eighth jhanas when ekagata one-pointedness becomes predominant the grosser feeling tones of pity and sukha drop and replace with the more refined factor of pekka equanimity upekka feels like peacefulness that all is right and well independent of circumstances as concentration develops the jhana factors naturally arise on their own you cannot stay with the object while simultaneously checking to see whether the jhana factors are present. Repeatedly checking the jhana factors splits your attention and weakens concentration, so you will not have enough meditative energy for the jhana factors to develop. During daily practice, the jhana factors can sometimes arise weak, weakly, but usually a dedicated retreat is required for the, them to arise strongly. The jhana factors arise as concentration develops. When the jhana factors are present, the nimitta, or the light that appears when concentration deepens, becomes closer to arising. The Venerable Pa'aksaida emphasizes that the student never takes a jhana factor as an object of meditation to progress towards absorption or jhana. The jhana factors should be regarded as the force that mysteriously opens the student to jhana not the object of concentration. To progress towards the first jhana during Anapanasati meditation, awareness of your breath crossing the Anapanas body is always your object of concentration. To focus on any other object is to erode concentration and decrease the likelihood of the first jhana rising. Concentration wanes every time your attention moves off the object. Some modern teachings encourage meditators to take jhana factors as the object. Even in the suttas, with certain translations and the apparent vagueness of the instructions, it can sound as though the suttas refer to taking jhana factors as an object. Common knowledge of absorptions in the Buddha's day may have minimized the need for him to give detailed instructions on jhanas, as people of his time were likely to be quite familiar with the instructions. However, if you review the Vasudhimagga, which presents much more detailed instructions, it clearly states that the meditator should continue with the primary object to maintain the integrity of the concentration all the way into absorption. The Venerable Pa'aksaita also explicitly instructs us not to turn away from the breath as it crosses the Anapanasat at any time during Anapanasati. 
Although you may check the jhana factors to determine which jhana is present, this should be done only briefly. In our experience, using the jhana factors as an object is very, very pleasant, but leads only to an intense momentary or access concentration, which are the stages of concentration prior to absorption. Concentration is described later in this chapter. This is because as meditators progress through the four jhanas, they need to change the primary object several times in rapid succession and within a short amount of time. Concentration, by definition, is a unification of attention. The most effective way to unify attention is to stay with one object throughout a particular practice. As mentioned earlier, once the jhana factors have arisen with sufficient strength, they can be used to counteract the hindrances. The first step is to meet each hindrance with kind compassion rather than judgment. When you can apply the jhana factors to the specific hindrance, then you can apply the jhana factors to the hindrance. For example, if restlessness is rising, arising routinely enough to be a distraction, you can begin specifically cultivating bliss. Bliss is the antidote to restlessness. The Buddha discussed starving the hindrances and feeding the factors of awakening in Ahara Sutta. Each jhana factor neutralizes a specific hindrance as follows. Applied attention, Ritaka, calms sense desire. Sustained attention, Vikara, pacifies ill will aversion joy or pity vanquishes sloth and torpor bliss sukha eliminates restlessness and remorse one pointedness akagata overcomes doubt types of concentration momentary access and absorption as the samatha practice is fundamentally a concentration meditation we should take some time to more deeply understand the word concentration means in this context. In English, we already use the word concentration in many other senses, which can itself be a bit of a problem. As young people, many of us were told, concentrate on your homework, or something similar, which implies a kind of expending effort or straining. Or while driving, we may feel that in heavy traffic, we must concentrate to avoid getting in an accident. Most of our modern applications of the word imply a striving energy. We encourage you to put aside these co uh, connotations of the word concentrate in doing this practice. Instead, begin to view concentration as a natural faculty inherent to the mind, which is drawn out through the incredible practice of Buddhist meditation. We see concentration as a natural byproduct of focusing on one object to the exclusion of everything else. In this context, then, concentration can be defined as the education of mind. You don't need to do it to make it happen. All you need to do is apply your attention to your object over hour after hour, and concentration will naturally arise. It is like growing a flower. A plant the seed, water it, and provide adequate sunshine. Standing over it and exhorting it to grow won't accelerate its growth. It will grow all by itself. Once it starts growing, you can apply skillful means to encourage it, what we have called building the muscle of concentration. Meditators encounter three types of concentration in the Samatha practice. Number one, momentary concentration. Two, access concentration. Absorption. Con it is important to understand each of these types of concentration, how they differ, and how they relate to one another. Momentary concentration. Momentary concentration is the most difficult to understand because there are two types. The first develops in Vipassana practices in which the object changes in contrast to samatha practices in which the object object is constant in vipassana vipassana the object is in a way changing or moving as such one could say that the ultimate object of vipassana meditation is the present moment and what's being perceived in the present moment hence the relationship to momentary con insight oriented Momentary concentrations are widely used and can be found in meditations such as Vipassana, as is commonly practiced in North America and Europe, as well as in the Tibetan Joksin jo jo <laughs> Rigpa practices and Shikantanza practice. The Venerable Paak Sayadaw presents the four elements meditation, which is a momentary concentration practice, as the entry Vipassana practices. We describe this practice in chapter. The second type of momentary creation arises during samatha practice. The Venerable Paak Sayada sometimes refers to this type of momentary concentration as preparatory concentration. It prepares the meditator for and precedes access concentration, the second type of concentration. 
In Samatha practice, the meditation object is consistent rather than change. Having a consistent object leads to serenity and mind. Access concentration. Meditators can eventually attain access concentration, either type of momentary concentration, samatha or vipassana. However, samatha practices are more likely to lead to action because of their more stable. Access concentration is characterized by the significant reduction or complete dropping off of the five hindrances and the arising and strengthening of the jhanas. For most people, a pure intensive practice is required to reach access concentration. In access concentration, the meditative experience becomes smoother, easier, and more pleasant because of this lessening hindrances and the arising of the powerful and blissful sensations. This allows meditators to meditate longer and progress more easily in the practice. It becomes a positive self-reinforcing loop. It is easy to confuse momentary concent with access concentration. One difference is that with access concentration, the meditator's continuity with the object is much longer and more stable over time. Another difference is that with access concentration, the object is much more energized and bright. Most of the practices outlined in this book are samatha practices specifically designed to settle the mind and develop laser-like awareness, leading eventually to full absorption to the jhanas. Examples of samatha practices designed to develop access, con access and absorption concentration are Anapanasati meditation as presented by Bhairava Pak, the Kasinas, 32 parts of the body meditation, skeleton meditation, and the Brahma because of the sublime abide. As ex access concentration develops, but prior to full absorption, it is also easy to confuse access with absorption concentration. In access concentration, the jhana factors are present, but insufficiently strong for full absorption to jhana. The differences between access and absorption are described below. Even after a meditator has experienced full jhana absorption and begins to move through the practice progression, access concentration continues. With progression to each successive jhana, the meditator first experiences access concentration as the awareness orients to the new experiences and increases in stability. Absorption concentration. The words jhana and absorption are synonymous. In absorption concentration, awareness is pulled into the jhana with a snap. The beginning meditator cannot will the absorption to happen or make it happen. Uh, full absorption arises only when the concentration is strong and ripe after many days, weeks, months, or even years of unwavering focus on a specific meditative object. Only later, as a meditator becomes more experienced with full jhana absorption and more skilled with the progression of jhanas and the five jhana, jhana masteries, is it possible to enter a jhana at will. The five jhana masteries are specific attainments that meditators complete each jhana as demonstration of mastery before they can pro progress to the next jhana. They are described in chapter 4. In absorption, in addition to the strong presence of the appropriate jhanic factors, awareness is extremely secluded and, and ongoing concentration is more easily maintained. Awareness fully penetrates and fused by the jhana factors. The Vasudhi Maga highlights the difference between this and absorption concentration using the analogy of walking. Access concentration is a toddler learning to walk. The child can take a few steps, but repeat falls down. In contrast, absorption concentration is like an adult who is able to stand down. A modern metaphor would be a thing. In access concentration, needs constant attention, wobbles frequently, and falls down. In absorption, the top spins in a centered way on its own. There may be misconceptions about the experience of full absorption. In First, there is awareness while in jhana. It is not a zombie state, trans period of unconscious. However, there is no sense of me. While in jhana, the only awareness while in full absorption is of the object. If meditators have awareness of data from the five senses, it is because they are temporarily, temporarily out of absorption. The five senses, sight, hearing, taste, and smell, do not arise while in absorption jhana. In addition, there is no thought or decision-making while fully absorbed in jhana. Beginning meditators who find that they are thinking or noticing input from the sense doors should view this as a slight imperfection of jhana rather than full jhana absorption. 
Meditators can also pop out of jhana unintentionally because concentration wins in the first and the jhanic factors lessen. It is best not to worry about initial imperfections which are bound to happen as beginners are developing master. As concentration increases, these imperfections and stability increases. Awareness in the jhanas is incredibly pristine, purifying, and indescribable. It is distinctly different from access concentration. Because access concentration can be so pleasant and non-ordinary, however, people sometimes mistake access concentration for absorption when it this is one reason why it is important to retrieve guidance from a qualified teacher who knows the difference between activation and absorption concentration. Absorption concentration is an incredibly powerful tool for purification, refinement of awareness, and access to realms far beyond normal, everyday comprehension. In addition, this intense focus can be an incredibly powerful to apply to the Vipassana practice. Meditation powered by the supercharged energy of the jhanas or even a strong access concentration can provide a vehicle to insight beyond normal perception that may not be possible with momentary concentration. We should note that because awareness is so refined in full absorption, sensory input that would seem minimal in ordinary consciousness can feel extremely jarring when emerging from jhana. This experience is intensified further when a meditator has completed weeks or months of deep absorption practice and re-enters world. Hindrances. Hindrances draw our awareness away from our object. Ultimately, they are the cause of suffering, both while meditating and in our daily lives. The five hindrances are 1. Sense desire. 2. Ill will slash aversion. 3. Sloth and tor- 4. Restlessness and remorse. 5. Doubt. Sense desire is seeking pleasant experiences through the five senses, touch, taste, smell, sight, and hearing. While meditating, sense desire can take the form of wanting a better meditation, wishing for blissful states to arise, and so on. Rather than being with your object, you begin to suffer because you want something that you don't have. Ill will slash aversion can take many forms, anger or judgment of yourself, others, an event. It can also manifest as dislike and fear. In meditation, this can take the form of finding your nature circumstances, judging your own practice, or even fearing that your sense of me will be threatened by the fruition of your practice. One of the most common forms of aversion that arise while meditating is aversion to physical pain. As with all the hindrances, if pain arises while sitting, do not take pain as the object. This is the difference between this practice and the mindfulness practice as taught in the turn of Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw, in which you would turn your awareness towards the pain became predominant. In concentration practice, always stay with the primary object of meditation, which in this case is the breath. You stay with your one object, you're building the muscle of concentration, whereas the Vipassana practice is building the muscle of being with things as they are, as they arise. Sloth is often used to describe sluggishness, where torpor is drowsy mind state. In meditating, torpor frequently appears as sleepiness. If you are generally sleep deprived, sometimes it is best just to take a nap. However, if you've had enough sleep, which tends to be the case on retreat, sloth and torpor often reveal an unconscious reluctance to be with the practice and your situation arising. With wisdom, sloth and torpor can sometimes be seen as a sign of some underlying avoidance. Restlessness is an unsettled mental state. Remorse is the sense of regretting past actions. In sitting, these can appear as restlessness while meditating and as impatience in wanting the sitting to end. Doubt can show itself as distrust, distrust, distrust in the teacher, the teachings, or your ability to meditate properly and effectively. With concentration practice in particular, people often have a lot of doubt and uncertainty about their progress as well as their capacity for the practice. In daily practice and on retreat, nearly every meditator will experience one or more of the hindrances. When any of the hindrances arise, you should determine which hindrance is present. Heartfelt compassion for the hindrance in yourself is a vital first step. The skillful use of effort discussed more extensively in Chapter 4 can also be an antidote to the hints in this practice. On retreat helps considerably if you guard the sense doors by keeping your vision mostly downward while fostering 
compassion and loving kindness for yourself and others. Also, you can develop a kind of love for the meditative object and the timeless deep silence and stillness that are ever present. This depth of silence and the accompanying accepting can are a balm for the outbreak of hindrances. You can take refuge in the pristine silence of the practice. The Venerable Pa'ak Sayadaw instructs students that the five jhanic factors are a wholesome medicine for the five hindrances. As we turn away from the hindrances and towards the jhanic factor, the hindrances recede and the jhana factors increase. Jhana factors. The jhana factors are byproducts of concentration. Usually, we must undertake an intensive period of practice such as a read for them to arise with sufficient strength to be noticeable. Sometimes people get confused, thinking that the jhana factors are to pleasant emotions as experienced in everyday life. This is a misconception. In actuality, the jhana factors are specific conditions that arise as a result of the mind unifying through purification and the building the muscle of concentration that develops as we turn away from hindrances, hour after hour. This is why it can be said that, in a way, the jhana factors replace the hindrances. The five jhana factors are applied attention, Vitaka, sustained attention, vikara, vikara, joy, pity, bliss, sukha, and one-pointedness, ekagata. Vitaka. Vitaka, which is translated as applied attention, is the initial movement of attention to the meditation object, to the meditative object. For example, when you find your attention has wandered from the breath crossing the anapana spot, gently direct it back. Each time your attention wanders, non-judgmentally return it to the object. Initially, your sole job, if you will, is to apply attention to the object. With many repetitions and a strengthening of concentration, the object eventually becomes more and more stable and you have less need to continually reapply your attention. Until this happens, though, you must be diligent and consistent without being heavy-handed and applying attention to your object. Vikara. Vikara is translated as sustained attention. As your attention stays with the object, its coherence develops through the uninterrupted continuity. When your attention does not wander from the object for 30 minutes, the car becomes even stronger and is more noticeable. In daily life, you attempt to focus on the object primarily during formal sitting practice for however long you sit, but you can also return to it lightly throughout the day while working at the grocery store or before falling asleep in bed at night. Whether on retreat or meditating at home, when you are doing concentration practice, your attention should never waver from the object. It is a kind of love affair with the object, which initially is the breath as it crosses the Anapan spot. Although it, is, although it isn't usually possible in daily practice as a householder, on retreat you should apply your attention to the object and sustain it constantly throughout the day. The car strengthens by maintaining attention on the breath crossing the Anapan spot. While in meditative posture, meditation posture, as well as when walking, eating, showering, and moving around. While doing the Anapana meditation practice, before, during, and after each and every inhalation, pause, exhalation, and pause, your attention is on the breath as it crosses the Anapana spot. You never, never, never take your attention off the breath crossing the Anapana spot. Every activity is done while simultaneously placing attention on the object. At some point, Vikara can become so strong that the awareness snaps onto the object and rarely, if it ever, leaves. Think of the metaphor of balancing a spoon on the end of your nose. Throughout every activity of the day and night, you are trying to keep the spoon balanced on your nose. Should the spoon slip off, you place it back on your nose and keep your attention exactly on the spot where the spoon touches your skin. When you can apply your attention to the object and sustain it on the object, the jhanic jhana factors arise naturally. Pity. Pity, which is translated as joy, is a joy that is without specific situational cause because it results from the cohering of the mind. We have found the term joy in this case to be a little difficult for some students to differentiate from other pleasant or happy feelings they may experience in everyday life. Pity, as experienced, feels like happiness in the body. Although it it is actually a mentally induced state. Sometimes it is referred to as rapture. 
Because pity can be so intense in the body, it can actually cause restlessness in some people. This grosser, grosser aspect of pity becomes beneficial as meditators progress through the jhanas because it allows non-attachment to pleasant experiences to gradually emerge. Sukha. Sukha means bliss, but bliss is a tricky word because it has so many meanings and implications. Sukha is best understood as a mentally sensed bliss that is also felt subtly in the body. While pity could be experienced as bodily happiness, sukha can be experienced more like a gentle contentment. Sukha is more settled and refined in its feeling than pit pity. Pity is more excitable in its feeling and somewhat more gross. Again, both are produced mentally. Ekagata or ekagata is described as one-pointedness of mind. This mental state is experienced as a focusing of attention and intention as a collecting and unifying of meditative energy. There is an experience of uninterrupted unification with the meditation object, meditative object. Think of a flashlight whose beam of light can be adjusted wider or narrower. When the beam of light is narrowed to the visual width of a pencil and the functioning of a laser, this would be analogous to agagata and concentration practice. The attention is highly coherent, increasingly like a laser beam. In the first jhana, the above five jhana factors are present. However, as the meditator progresses to the fourth jhana, the factor of upekka, equanimity, arises in addition to replace the feeling of sukha, bliss. This is because a feeling, mental state, is present in all the jhanas up through and including the eighth jhana. In the fourth through the eighth jhanas, when Ekagata, one-pointedness, becomes predominant. The grosser feeling tones of pity and sukha drop and replace with the more refined factor of upekka, equanimity. Upekka feels like peacefulness, that all is right and well, independent of circumstances. As concentration develops, the jhana factors naturally arise on their own. You cannot stay with the object while simultaneously checking to see whether the jhana factors are present. Repeatedly checking the jhana factors splits your attention and weakens concentration, so you will not have enough meditative energy for the jhana factors to develop. During daily practice, the jhana factors can sometimes arise weak, weakly, but usually a dedicated retreat is required for the, them to arise strongly. The jhana factors arise as concentration develops. When the jhana factors are present, the nimitta, or the light that appears when concentration deepens, becomes closer to arising. The Venerable Pa'aksaida emphasizes that the student never takes a jhana factor as an object of meditation to progress towards absorption or jhana. The jhana factor should be regarded as the force that mysteriously opens the student to jhana not the object of concentration. To progress towards the first jhana during Anapanasati meditation, awareness of your breath crossing the Anapanas body is always your object of concentration. To focus on any other object is to erode concentration and decrease the likelihood of the first jhana rising. Concentration wanes every time your attention moves off the object. Some modern teachings encourage meditators to take jhana factors as the object. Even in the suttas, with certain translations and the apparent vagueness of the instructions, it can sound as though the suttas refer to taking jhana factors as an object. Common knowledge of absorptions in the Buddha's day may have minimized the need for him to give detailed instructions on jhanas, as people of his time were likely to be quite familiar with the instructions. However, if you review the Vasudhimaga, which presents much more detailed instruction, it clearly states that the meditator should continue with the primary object to maintain the integrity of the concentration all the way into absorption. The Venerable Pa'aksaita also explicitly instructs us not to turn away from the breath as it crosses the Anapana spot at any time during Anapanasati Manit. Although you may check the jhana factors to determine which jhana is present, this should be done only briefly. In our experience, using the jhana factors as an object is very, very pleasant, but leads only to an intense momentary or access concentration, which are the stages of concentration prior to absorption. Concentration is described later in this chapter. 
This is because as meditators progress through the four jhanas, they need to change the primary object several times in rapid succession and within a short amount of time. Concentration, by definition, is a unification of attention. The most effective way to unify attention is to stay with one object throughout a particular practice. As mentioned earlier, once the jhana factors have arisen with sufficient strength, they can be used to counteract the hindrances. The first step is to meet each hindrance with kind compassion rather than judgment. When you can apply the jhana factors to the specific hindrance, then you can apply the jhana factors to the hindrance. For example, if restlessness is rising, arising routinely enough to be a distraction, you can begin specifically cultivating bliss. Bliss is the antidote to restlessness. The Buddha discussed starving the hindrances and feeding the factors of awakening in Ahara Sutta. Each jhana factor neutralizes a specific hindrance as follows. Applied attention, Ritaka, calms sense desire. Sustained attention, Vikara, pacifies ill will aversion joy or pity vanquishes sloth and torpor bliss sukha eliminates restlessness and remorse one pointedness ekagata overcomes doubt types of concentration momentary access and absorption as the Samatha practice is fundamentally a concentration meditation we should take some time to more deeply understand the word concentration means in this context. In English, we already use the word concentration in many other senses, which can itself be a bit of a problem. As young people, many of us were told, concentrate on your homework, or something similar, which implies a kind of expending effort or straining. Or while driving, we may feel that in heavy traffic, we must concentrate to avoid getting in an accident. Most of our modern applications of the word imply a striving energy. We encourage you to put aside these co uh, connotations of the word concentrate in doing this practice. Instead, begin to view concentration as a natural faculty inherent to the mind, which is drawn out through the incredible practice of Buddhist meditation. We see concentration as a natural byproduct of focusing on one object to the exclusion of everything else. In this context, then, concentration can be defined as the vacation of mind. You don't need to do it to make it happen. All you need to do is apply your attention to your object over hour after hour and concentration will naturally arise. It is like growing a flower. A plant the seed, water it, and provide adequate sunshine. Standing over it and exhorting it to grow won't accelerate its growth. It will grow all by itself. Once it starts growing, you can apply skillful means to encourage it, what we have called building the muscle of concentration. Meditators encounter three types of concentration in the Samatha practice. Number one, momentary concentration. Two, access concentration. Absorption. Con it is important to understand each of these types of concentration, how they differ, and how they relate to one another. Chapter three, foundational understandings. This chapter provides a context for understanding some of the most important foundations for social access to and prolonged availability of the jhanas and outline several aspects that support the meditators approach to samatha meditation the major topics include putting aside what we know silence breathing resolves meditation timing and quote-unquote psychic powers putting aside what we know many people undertaking concentration practice have prior experience with one or more types of meditation. while learning concentration practice however you must disregard each every other type of medicine you have known including other jhana practices for example the retreat we attended with the venerable pa aksai now included many students who are quite skilled in the vipassana mindfulness meditation that is taught in the image of venerable mahasi sayadaw we witnessed that upon arising from seated meditation ni fellow retreats began the well-known mindful walking meditation also during public question sessions there were questions regarding how to be mindful by doing walking meditation. Often the teachers responded to the effect that it was good to be mindful while walking. Regrettably, the retreat leaders and retreatants were unaware that they were using the word mindful differently. In the Anapanasati meditation, as done in this practice, the word mindful always means placing and sustaining attention on the breath as it crosses the Anapana spot no matter what you're doing. In other practices, the word mindful is used to mean being aware of one's object at all times, even if that object changes. Because of this condition, in our opinion, 
Some of the retreatants released much of the concentrated meditative energy accumulated during sitting meditation by shifting to another meditation object when they got up and engaged in other duties, that is, the mindfulness of their walking. Students must also put aside what they know of other methods of creation practice as taught by modern teachers. Other methods are different, and if you apply those approaches, you may lose the concentration and prevent full absorption into the jhana from arising. For example, switching the meditative object from the breath crossing the anapana spot to a jhana factor will immediately begin to disperse the accumulated concentration. It will feel pleasant, but will gradually erode your ability to move from access content into absorption, possibly without you even knowing it. On retreat, anapana sati meditation is done to the absolute exclusion of everything else. Imagine that you're having a multi-course meal at a fine restaurant. You ask, your task is to consume the meal while searching exclusively for the taste of salt. You do not want to taste anything but salt. In each bite, you want to find salt, 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 salt. Nothing else is tasted. This is the kind of focus to apply at the anapana spot while undertaking any activity during a retreat. For daily practice, you can be more relaxed about varying practices unless you are engaging in the daily practice specifically to build a high level of content and preparation truths. Silence. In daily practice, you should find a location for meditation that is as still and quiet as possible. This could be a private room, an office, or some other location with privacy. While conducive surroundings are optimal, as householders, we must also learn to work with what life presents us. For example, Tina has been known to meditate on subway trains, trains or in bathrooms if that's all the situation allows. You can always be aware of the breath no matter what your surroundings are. In fact, meditating in less peaceful surroundings can help to build the capacity of concentration. This is why we don't recommend the use of earplugs or eye masks except in extreme circumstances. Using these devices can cultivate a kind of aversion that is difficult to overcome when you return to worldly engagement, especially if you use them for long periods on retreat. In addition, the strength of concentration that can develop when your awareness must turn away from these distractions is in itself helpful. In terms of silence while on retreat, one of the largest impediments to practice is talking. The busy everyday mind must become still to the point that external and internal talking cease. If you talk even the slightest amount during a concentrated retreat period, your accumulated meditative energy begins to dissipate. While it may seem insignificant to talk a little on retreat, the amount of concentration that burns off when you talk even minimally could be enough to prevent jhana from arising. In addition, talking activates the thinking mind, disrupting inner silence. We strongly encourage you to make the most of your many hours of sitting by maintaining a pristine con- and allowing other practitioners to briefly talking to a teacher during interview time or a question and answer period are the only exceptions. Conversely, some practitioners gain outer silence without silencing inner talk, which can take many forms. For some people, inner talk is a running commentary on life experiences and others may find constant evaluating and judging of the meditation's development to be a tempting topic for inner talk. All these forms of inner talk must become silent. Another way of framing this is to quote unquote renounce thinking for a period of sitting in daily practice or when on retreat. Maintaining a vigilant awareness of inner talk is a vital first step. You cannot influence what you do not notice. As such, vigilantly watch your inner chatter with persistence. Do this as skillful means not as a tool with which to judge or condemn yourself. An attitude of loving compassion is the best salve when it comes to inner chatter begins when the inner chatter begins a blend of turning away from the chatter coupled with compassion for its arising is the best approach at each developing stage of the anapanasati meditation practice allow your awareness to rest in the silence that is always present as concentration develops the silence becomes more and more of a magnet later inner thoughts and words drop away and the silence that precedes thoughts thought and expression of words is present to begin Direct your attention to the breath as it crosses the anapana spot on the upper lip just under the nose, to the exclusion of your internal chatter. Do not try to stop the mental chatter. Simply do not fuel it by commenting on it. Commenting on the inner chatter leads to judgments about the chatter and a turn to new comments on the judging itself. This naturally compounds the distraction from a passing issue to a time-consuming 
on retreat as your meditation period lengthened from 45 minutes to several hours, the mind settles and the talking becomes subtle, sometimes to the point of stopping. Longer periods of meditation are possible as the jhana factors of pity, joy, and sukha, bliss, increase and offset the physical or mental stress or pain that would normally be present. Inner chatter and thinking may diminish to such an extent that they are simply of no interest. In our retreat experience, the inner mind chatter did stop. As the silence deepened, any movement of the mind towards thinking became almost unbearable. In instances when Stephen experienced the mind turning towards its chatter after deep settling had begun, he was slightly nauseous, almost seasick. The process of thinking for the silence has become dominant feels very coarse energetically. Turning from deep-seated silence to inner or outer talking is not desirable. In fact, we found that when other retreatants tried to talk to us, it was almost painful. We felt conflicted between wanting to engage with others at a personal level and wanting to sustain the pristine concentration. Eventually, we avoided contact despite how others may have. It is possible to hold an attitude of loving kindness towards others while maintaining silence. If held in a pristine state, the dominant orientation of the meditative mind at this stage of silence is towards deeper and deeper silence. It becomes a self-reinforcing process. We found that there is a kind of energy or impulse to act that occurs prior to thinking. As the mind settled, thinking felt uncomfortably coarse. These pre-thinking impulses significant sufficient information to enable us to get up, serve ourselves a meal, use the toilet, and so on. It felt as though the impulse towards food, sleep, and so forth could be acted upon without directing the impulse to develop into a thought. It was reassuring to find that it is possible to function normally without the usual experience of thinking or internal commentary. Gradually, the thinning of the me can become more familiar and comfortable. Breathing. The breath is the cornerstone of the Anapanasati meditation. To begin a period with a few deep breaths helps, helps draw your attention to the breath crossing the Anapana spot. After a few breaths, do not make any effort to direct the breath. You can also be aware of each breath's duration, whether it is long or short. For Stephen, monitoring whether the breath was long or short was not helpful, but counting was actually useful. For Tina, using the traditional counting of one through eight or noticing, not noting as self-talk, but simply noticing whether the breath was long or short, initially concentration. Later, this was no longer necessary and could be dropped. Whatever the duration of the breath, maintain your attention on the breath as it crosses the autumn. As you inhale and exhale, your attention should remain fixed on the object. Keep your attention on the object even when there is little or no breath. The attitude is one of being present, waiting for the breath across the Anapana spot. One of the most frequent questions we are asked is, what if I can't feel the breath at the Anapana spot? We must remember that the actual instruction is to know the breath at the Anapana spot, not just to feel it. This becomes important later as the breath becomes more and more subtle. To answer the above question, we first encourage you to have the attitude of being present and attentive to the breath at the Anapanas. Second, know that as your awareness becomes more concentrated, you most likely will be able to perceive subtleties of the breath that are normally beyond your everyday perception. Stay with it, aim attentive. Third, be aware that any place within the region extending from the upper lip and including the nostrils, is fine to use as the Anapana spot. If one particular place is easier for you than another, just make sure not to follow the breath inside the body. Over time, if you stay with it, you will be able to use the breath at the Anapana spot as an object, just as hundreds of thousands of meditators have done over the millennia. millennia. On, long, on a long retreat, especially if the jhanas arise, the breath becomes more and more subtle. There is some distinction as to whether the breath actually stops in the fourth jhana. We would say that the breath becomes very, very subtle and feels as it has stopped, although we cannot explain how this is physically possible. The Venerable Pak Saidao instructs that the breath in the fourth and succeeding jhanas does, does indeed stop, citing the Rahogata Sutta. 
When beginning students check for the breath, this checking or investigating mind is outside of jhana. The investigating mind and full absorption cannot coexist simultaneously. The investigating mind does produce a very, very subtle breath. Due to very strong concentration, beginning students may not realize they are shifting from full jhana absorption and concentration to the investigating mind, as it may occur in an instant. Because the shift can be so quick, it can appear to beginning students that there is a continuity of breath in fourth and seating jhanas. In either case, the body and mind can sometimes experience a surge of fright at the possibility of insufficient breath to keep the body alive. The experience of bodily fright is fairly normal. It is important, however, not to give in to the sense of panic by taking a large breath at the time of fright or by continuing to investigate this phenomena. Either action will menace concentrate and set you back in your effort to still the mind enough for deep concentration to lead to nimitta and jhana. It is best to trust the process as it unfolds. As the anapana meditation practice deepens, the pause between breaths may become longer. Maintain your attention strictly on the object. If the awareness of breath is present at the anapana spot, know it. If there is no awareness of breath, continue to focus your attention on waiting. Resolves. Resolving to stay in jhana for specific duration and emerging from jhana at a determined time are two of the five jhana masters. The five masteries are discussed in detail in chapter 5. The use of resolves is a meditative skill that you will be expected to develop should your practice progress to the point of jhana while on retreat. For example, a time resolve such as may first jhana arise for three hours is, a, is typical of what we used on the retreat with uh, Venerable Paoxido. We also incorporated the use of other resolves in order to cultivate specific jhanic factors or absorption in particular jhana. The form Tina used was to very subtly resolve for a jhana factor or a specific jhana to arise by silently, silently saying a phrase such as, May pity be strong, strongly. May the first jhana arise strongly before a meditation. Then she would let go of the thought or intention and settle back on the breath, crossing the autumn. This takes only a few seconds so as not to dissipate concentration. A resolve is not a mantra or a grasping statement. It is not repeated over and over. It is simply a sim single resolution to open to the arising of a particular aspect of practice. Stephen used resolves early in the retreat and prior to settling into Anapanasati Medit. He would silently say to himself the following resolves which he composed. There is no identity in these thoughts. There is no identity in these emotions. There is no identity in these... There is no identity in this body. There is no identity in these feelings. There is no identity in perceptions. He called these anatta or no self resolves. This was helpful to his practice. It thinned the normal sense of identity to better allow jhana to arise. If some other topic arose to be included, he would include it. And he used the regular jhana factor and jhana resolve as well. He also found that a silent offering of daily gratitude and for the Anapanasati meditation and its progression deepened the intimacy of the meditation. For us, after the first day or two, the resolves would arise quickly and pass through awareness as an expression of meditative intention. A little later in the retreat, we employed an energetic experience of these resolves without needing to express them internally with words. At the appropriate time, we would open to the energy of these now unspoken resolves. As you move to various jhanas or practices, you can change the resolves appropriately. Meditation timing. If you intend to participate in a concentration retreat, we highly recommend that you begin to meditate for longer and longer periods of time prior to the retreat. If you are comfortable meditating for 40 minutes once a day, increase to 45 minutes two or three times a day. As that becomes comfortable, increase each meditation period to one hour per period. If your preparation allows, we suggest getting to the point at where you can meditate two hours twice a day. This gives you a very good start. If you are able to begin the Anapanasati practice a week or two prior to the concentration commencement of the retreat, this also assists your progress. 
Once the retreat begins, meditate as long and as often as you can. Ideally, you want to meditate three or four periods a day. If possible, within the first week or ten days, each time period should be increased to one, two, and three hours. Two hours is better than one hour, and three hours is better than two hours, was the Venerable Paoxidal's direction to us. Many people think this is impossible to do. This is where it is very important to understand the difference between practices that cultivate momentary concentration and practices that cultivate deep access concentration and eventually jhana absorption. At the time of the Pa'ak retreat, both of us had previously had extensive uh, experience with other practices that cu cultivate momentary concentration, such as the Vipassana mindfulness practice, the Tibetan Dzogchen practice of Rigpa, and the Shikantanza meditation practice of Zen. While it is possible for us to meditate for several consecutive hours during these practices on previous long retreats, we reflected that it was much more of a struggle to do these practices for many hours than it was to do jhana meditation. When the Venerable Pa'ak Sayadal told Tina to do three hours and eventually four hours in first jhana, she told him she didn't think she could do it. She had never meditated that long before, but because in the jhanas the hindrances have dropped completely in some cases, it is possible to feel pleasant and not in pain when met. And when the awareness is absorbed fully into a jhana, it is quite definitely possible because most outer distractions are not perceived with the senses are so slight that they don't matter. Even at the Pa'ak retreat, when we tried to sit for hours listening to a talk, we found the experience different from the more difficult than sitting for hours in deep access or absorption concentration. This demonstrates the constant this demonstrates the contrast between strong and weak concentration. The relief from the hindrances and the blissful feeling of the jhana factors present with strong concentration are what make it possible to sit for long hours. In addition, because Westerners have not been raised for their entire lives to sit on Zafu or on the floor as Asians uh, have traditionally been, the Venerable Pa'ak Saido graciously allows people to use a chair when necessary and when doing multi-hour sitting periods. He does prefer that students use the traditional floor posture, and in fact, on our retreat, there were several Asian retreatants who sat only on a grass mat with no cushion. But for Westerners, the Venerable Pa'ak Saido feels it is most important to do what best facilitates effective practice. So use of a chair if necessary, maintaining effective upright posture with on the floor. So use a chair if necessary, maintaining effective upper posture with your form. To cult cultivate both your belief that two or three hours of continuous meditation is possible and your ability to do so, when you do formal meditation, sit for the entire period you intended before the meditation began. If you told yourself you would meditate for an hour, do not arise and test. If two hours, sit for two hours. You need to develop the time commitment discipline very early on in retreat. With the bliss of the jhana factors, this is not only possible, but also enjoyable. After two weeks, you should be able to meditate for the entire period without moving or while moving very little. This may sound difficult to downright impossible, but it isn't. It is a matter of opening yourself to the reality that tens of thousands of meditators throughout history have able to do this. If you are convinced you can do it, you will be amazed to learn you can. A yogi asked us a great question in the Dhamma talk. Um, we gave at a long retreat at the Forest Refuge Retreat Center in Barry, Massachusetts. It was something like this. What did each of you do in your own practice that helped you progress? One of the main things that we both did was to closely monitor both the length of time of our formal sitting meditations between formal sitting. We made sure never to let too much time elapse between sittings, as we could perceive that the concentration would start to wane if the gaps were too long. This meant that any time there was a meal, instead of adding on a rest period afterwards, we might incorporate a sitting after lunch and rest later in the day. On retreat, we encourage yogis never to let more than two waking hours, or preferably one, pass without following it with a sitting period equally long or longer. For example, we might sit first thing upon waking, then shower and eat, then sit, then take a mid-morning movement break, then sit, then eat lunch, then sit, then a movement break, then sit, then tea, and so forth. When we were sitting for two or three hour periods, the day would fly by. We would do one sitting before breakfast, eat breakfast, do one sitting, eat lunch, do one sitting, drink tea, do one sitting, sleep. 
The point is, no matter how long your sitting periods are, try not to burn off your concentration in between or it will never reach the boiling point. Just as taking the lid off a pot of water to check its temperature will delay, if not prevent it from boiling. Remember, even while moving around, your attention is still on your prime to cultivate continuity. Quote unquote psychic powers. In the following chapters, we will detail our experience of the many traditional Theravada Buddhist practices we learned with the Venerable Pa'ak Sayadaw. Some people may be surprised to see these types of practices as part of the traditional Buddhist path, or they may think psychic powers are required to complete them. However, using powers beyond normal awareness is a time-honored practice known throughout Buddhism for more than 2,500 years starting with the Buddha. We also have precedents of modern teachers such as the Venerable Pa'ak Sayadaw and Deepama, not to mention the many lay and monastic practitioners at Pa'ak Monastery in Myanmar who do these practices daily. To provide another context, in the Sam Saman Nana Fala Sutta, the Buddha directs us that the mind thus concentrated, purified and bright, unblemished, free from defects, pliant, malleable, steady, and attained to imperturbability, is directed and inclined to the modes of supranormal powers. It is worth noting that the Buddha does not say supernatural, but rather supranormal. These powers are not outside or beyond what is natural. Rather, the meditative powers or abilities used in Buddhist practice are merely beyond what is considered normal. As the mind is collected, unified, and stabilized through the rise of the jhana factors and entry into absorption, a purified brightness of mind is apparent. This laser-like concentration is focused and capable of penetrating in a non-ordinary manner. It is sometimes referred to as the divine eye or wisdom eye. See the Ariana Parayasana Sutta. The wisdom eye is used to some extent in nearly all the meditations presented in this book, including the Anapanasati meditation, 32 parts of the body meditation, skeleton meditation, casino meditations, sublime abiding meditations, protective meditations, and four elements meditation. While modern practitioners may see these practices as beyond what is normally possible, we encourage you to remember that thousands of Buddhists have done these practices for more than 25 The Buddha identified doubt as one of the five hindrances. Your own confidence and strong faith, lack of doubt, will serve you well as you undertake these practices. Chapter 4. Skillful Effort from First Sit to First Jhana In this chapter, we will discuss the territory leading up to full absorption into first jhana. For many, if not most meditators, this is the most challenging territory of the whole path, which is why we are dedicating a full chapter to it. Many meditators spend an entire retreat, many retreats, or the complete duration of their practice solely within this territory. Applying the foundations discussed in the previous chapters will assist in navigating this important terrain. Aspects of Appropriate Effort we should note that, while the contents of this chapter are relevant to both daily and retreat practice, much of what is described here is most relevant for the retreatant. Nonetheless, all who undertake this beautiful practice can benefit from a greater understanding and application of the skillful and wise use of appropriate effort, as this is one of the most important aspects of concentration meditation practice. Intention. Effort begins with intention. Initially, we recommend that you take the time to clarify your intentions for engaging in concentration meditation. Why take on the practice? Pose this question initially and allow the answer to come from a deep knowing within. A wholesome intention is essential. Common wholesome responses include collecting the scattered mind, deepening serenity, purifying the mind stream, and developing a laser-like focus, which later serves to engage the insight portions of the Buddhist path of liberation. With the greater, greater clarity of intention, we now turn towards developing the proper attitude to assist us in this practice. Blocks to skillful effort. Before exploring skillful, skillful effort, it is beneficial to understand what actions block skillful effort. There are many ways to slow, if not stop, skillful effort. We have noted several blocks that meditators consistently encounter when undertaking concentration meditation. 
The first of these blocks is attempting to use previously learned meditative techniques in this practice. Many people have been meditating and maintaining a daily meditation practice for 10, 20, 30, or even 40 years. While prior experience with meditation can be greatly, greatly beneficial to people's lives overall, it can be an impediment here. For example, for people with extensive experience in the insight practices taught in the tradition of the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw, being mindful means bringing attention to wherever is most predominant in awareness. This might be the breath, thoughts, emotions, the physical act of walking when moving, or the mechanics of movement while eating. In effect, the meditation, the meditative object often changes with each new action. In concentration practice, the meditation object remains the same throughout the practice. While engaging in Anapanasati meditation, the object is always the breath as it moves across the Anapana spot. Moreover, in mindfulness meditation, should you experience pain, you may move your attention to the location of pain as the predominant meditation object. In the past, if you were practicing mindfulness meditation, you may have been able to stay with the pain to the point of seeing its arising and passing, its inherent impermanence. In concentration meditation, should you experience pain, keep your attention on the primary object rather than moving to the pain as the object. Do not turn your attention to any distraction from the primary object. Instead, turn away from the distraction purpose fully. If you shift from the breath to the pain as the meditation object, meditative object, the collective concentration begins to dissipate. Another seemingly innocuous error people can make is comparing their meditation to what they expect to be the progression of the practice. As an example, some people report that after each meditation, they compare that, that sitting period to their previously identified deep meditations. They sometimes rate the experience. Others report evaluating how strong each jhana factor is in a particular meditation, comparing the results to previous meditation or retreats. All of this leads to an increase in the comparing and evaluating mind, which also begins to disperse the, the reserve of concentration that has collected during their practice. Working with the hindrances. In chapter 2, we outlined the five hindrances. Sense, desire, ill will, aversion, sloth and torpor, restlessness and remorse, and doubt. In commencing concentration meditation, you take the breath at the Anapana spot as your object. As you settle into your meditation, an initial stillness and silence develops. In this stillness and silence, your submerged or not so submerged hindrances pattern may begin to emerge. In part due to the silence you are experiencing, the hindrances may be more pronounced than when muffled by normal social distractions such as talking, eating, viewing, entertainment, and socializing. In nearly every type of meditation, you can be plagued by hindrances. However, because concentration practices focus solely on one object, hitting a hindrance can sometimes feel more intense than with other practices. One teacher makes the analogy that in momentary concentration practices, because the primary object is the present moment and whatever is predominant in awareness is the is the present moment, the practice can feel a bit like traveling down a country lane. If there is a rock, you may hit it, but you may also go around it. Conversely, concentration meditation can sometimes feel like going down a steep hill on ice skates. If you hit a rock, it may feel like a boulder because the effect can be quite jarring and dramatic. Further, since the ground is icy, you may have minimal ability to slow down before hitting the rock or you may be even surprised by it. You must face the issue of the boulder in the middle of the path that is the hindrance arising in meditation simply because there is nothing else you can do. With nearly every distraction faced in this practice, the hindrance should be engaged only when it prevents you from staying with the medit meditative object. For example, if you are routinely experience, experiencing sloth and torpor, Disregard this hindrance unless and until you literally cannot find the meditative object. Only when you cannot locate or stay with the object do you turn your awareness directly towards the hindrance. We have found an analogy to be useful in understanding 
how to work with hindrances in the Samatha practice. In past years, Tina was certified as a scuba diver. For those who have not seen scuba divers enter the ocean, they put on their scuba suits, air tank, face mask, and fins, and enter the water by walking backwards down the beach. The area in the water immediately off the, the beach where the waves are breaking is referred to as the surf zone. In the surf zone, the waves are unpredictable. The scuba diver's primary intention is to get through the surf zone and into calm ocean quickly and safely without being knocked down by the crashing waves. Some of the time, divers move successfully through the surf zone without an incident. That is, the hindrances do not knock them off their feet. At other times, divers are hit by the crashing waves and knocked about. They might be pulled underwater and get water and sand in their mask. Their fins might fall off. At this point, divers must refocus their concentration, stand up in the water, clean the mask, reposition the fins, and resume the trek through the unknown waves in the surf zone. This is very similar to the path of meditators engage when they undertake the summit to practice. We don't know which hindrances or defilements will arise as small, innocent waves and which may suddenly rear up, filled with unexpected power, attempting to knock us off the meditative object. If you are not knocked completely underwater into the swirl of hindrances and defilements, continue your journey through the meditative surf zone. When the waves are too strong and overpower your best intentions, pick yourself up, straighten what is unsettled, and continue your journey towards the open, calm sea beyond the surf zone. Sometimes it takes many trips to the surf zone. Sometimes you may gulp down a lot of salt water. But eventually, if you stay focused and persist, you will break through the surf zone and into the open sea. Once you get your bearings, you can proceed to actually begin scuba diving, plunging to greater depths into the stillness where the waves no longer crash. There, it is peaceful, beautiful, and even easy. You can look up to the waves overhead and not be touched by them. This is what happens when the hindrances are quelled by the jhana factors and you are eventually pulled into full absorption of the first jhana. So when one or more hindrances overshadow the meditative object in the summit practice, deliberately turn your attention from the meditative object to the hindrances at hand. If sloth and torpor arise, direct your attention specifically and exclusively to the experience of sloth and torpor. Do not analyze or think about the hindrance. Rather, meet the hindrance, drawing it close. Often, if you meet the hindrance directly, its energy begins to dissipate. You may not even do anything other than be with the hindrance. During a period of working with strong hindrances at the start of each meditation period, Test to see whether it is possible to stay with your original meditative, uh, meditative object. If so, move your attention away from the hindrance and back to the primary object, disregarding the hindrance as you make your way into deeper seas. Attitude When you initially start on a Panasati meditation, your physical and mental energy need to be high. Cultivating a positive attitude is very helpful. If you allow your energy to wane, it will be difficult to sustain your attention at the Anapana spot long enough for jhana factors to arise. The most useful attitude is one of openness, acceptance, and appropriate surrender. By openness, we mean bringing curiosity to the meditation, the curiosity of not knowing what will happen during each meditation. Each breath of each meditation period is new. This is how you want to meet each breath as a new discovery. Acceptance means not resisting what is occurring within the experiences of each breath of every meditation. As discussed previously, your sole job in this practice is to stay with the meditative object continuously, ceaselessly. We use the term surrender to signify letting go of your agenda and willfulness, knowing that the meditation moves, changes, and progresses in its own time. Patiently wait, showing up and practicing fresh, open, and without expectation. Persistence. Persistence in this practice means continuing to show up for each sitting period no matter how you're feeling. On retreat, it also means staying with the meditative object as continuously as possible between sitting periods 
when engaged in all other activities, when walking, eating, showering, and so on, continue to direct your attention to the breath crossing the Anapanasbant. Some people experience too much persistence, which comes from trying too hard. This often manifests as restlessness and striving. The opposite of too much persistence, too little persistence, produces laziness, sloth, and torpor. One example the Buddha used to demonstrate the proper tension in our meditation practice is the strings on a lute. When the strings are too tight, the lute sounds strained, and the strings being under pressure eventually break. Should the strings become too loose, too lax, the sound is equally poor, sometimes producing no sound at all. When we apply the proper amount of persistence, the strings are neither too loose nor too tight, but have the appropriate tension, and the resonant sound is beautiful. Meditation also deepens naturally when persistence is balanced and consistent. The eight landmarks from first set to first jhana. The vast majority of meditators who undertake concentration meditation practice spend significant time in the territory preceding first jhana. We have identified the following eight landmarks between the first sitting period and the full and full absorption in the first material jhana. Number one, first sit. Number two, nimitta commences. Number three, nimitta increases. Number four, nimitta becomes stable. Number five, nimitta becomes solid and energized. Number six, nimitta moves towards merging with the anapana spot. Number seven, nimitta and the anapana spot merge and become the anapana nimitta. Number eight, anapana nimitta draws the awareness into first jhana. Then mark one, first sit. Most of this book, up to this point, has described elements of practice relevant to preparing for the first preparing for the first sit. We have described numerous aspects of practice that yogis undertake, both on and off the cushion and developing concentration. The span of time between landmarks one and two can be long. For many meditators, a whole retreat or many retreats can pass without the appearance of the nimitta, regardless of whether a retreat encompasses the entire samatha practice path or simply this first landmark. It is vital to know that something worthwhile is happening. Meditators who del diligently undertake practice are building the muscle of concentration, cultivating serenity, and most important, purifying the mind stream. Landmark 2. Nimitta commences. Nimitta is an important component of this practice. It is a sign of powerful concentration. It arises in access concentration as a sign that the mind is unifying. References to the arising of the nimitta can be found in descriptions of modern meditation teachers such as Deepa Ma, who described a light when she meditated, even during Vipassana practice. The nimitta usually starts as a faint flicker, flickering light of light. It may also start as a smoky experience of the breath, like exhaling in cold winter temperatures. Others may, may perceive it as a round light, similar to a train or truck headlight. The nimitta can appear in a variety of colors and shapes. Sometimes the nimitta appears at a distance. Attach no significance to the features or location of the nimitta. Persist with maintaining your awareness on the medita meditative object exclusively. The nimitta is light seen in the mind's eye, not light seen with the human eyes. The nimitta arises on its own as a product, product of the natural unification of mind that develops with concentration. At first, we cannot will it to arise or make it arise. Later, as mastery increases, the nimitta arises upon invitation, as do the jhanas. Whether the nimitta, whatever the nimitta looks like or however it behaves, at this point do not shift awareness to it or look directly at it. The breath crossing the anapana spot continues to be the sole meditation object. As enticing as the nimitta is, don't even glance at it. Despite explicit instructions, nearly everyone tries to look at it or move attention towards the nimitta. When this happens, the nimitta usually fades or disappears. It's similar to trying to grab a cloud in your clenched fist. No matter how strong the desire to hold the cloud, it always eludes your grasp. 
many yogis train so hard to see the nimitta that they begin to experience stress headaches and even eye strain please do not do this to yourself the nimitta cannot be either perceived with the physical eyes or produced through your trying or wanting to see it it is generated in the mind as a byproduct of the unification of the awareness additionally if you want to see the nimitta so badly that the illusion of nimitta arises this will not ultimately result in jhana because it is not actually a sign of concentration imagining the nimitta are trying to create it is pointless as always doing the practice as it is designed and staying with the breath at the anapana spot as your sole object is the most skillful possible action you can take so at this point keep your attention on the breath crossing the anapana spot despite any excitement or desire to go to or purposely develop the nimitta landmark three nimitta increases once the nimitta begins appearing, it will continue to do so, provided that you stay with the meditative object, the breath as it crosses the Anapana spot. Further, if you are on retreat, do not allow long periods of time to pass without meditating. On retreat, it helps not to let more than an hour pass without a formal sitting period, thereby increasing your con continuity of deep practice. In addition, by staying with the object of meditation while meditating, walking, eating, or lying down, you further develop continuity of practice. The nimitta will arise more and more often as continuity of practice continues. It will gradually increase in size and be present more continuously throughout sitting meditation and even while the meditator is moving around with eyes open. We each had the experience of seeing the nimitta on occasion when our eyes were open while walking or eating. For Tina, at some points, the nimitta was visible consistently while walking around with eyes open. This is not required or necessary, but it can happen. Once the nimitta is present for the duration of nearly every meditation period, it is considered to be stable. Landmark 4. Nimitta becomes stable. The nimitta eventually becomes very stable. Each time you close your eyes, the nimitta is present. It is best to restrict all outflows of attention and energy, keeping your eyes downcast and your movements measured, and staying away from any inner or outer talking. The nimitta develops further if you are patient and diligently maintain awareness on the meditative object. If you attempt to go to the nimitta before concentration is developed sufficiently, anticipating its merging with the breath, it customarily it customarily breaks apart, fades, or disappears. If this happens, return the attention to the breath crossing the Anapana spot and wait for Nimitta to arise, again arise and stabilize. Landmark 5. Nimitta becomes solid and energized. As the Nimitta becomes more solid and apparent, it will begin to be energized. Conceptually, the difference between the solid and energized Nimitta is much like a neon business sign. When turned off, the sign can still be clearly read during daylight hours, yet may be unreadable at night. This is due to the lack of inherent energy flowing through the sign. When the nimitta becomes energized, the energy field containing the nimitta becomes crisp and bright. For some people who are not yet seeing the nimitta, at this point in the practice, the energy field where the nimitta will eventually appear is palpable. The energized nimitta is a sign of deepening access concentration. The student here usually experiences the jhana factors strongly and feel, feels very relaxed yet highly energized. Staying on the object becomes increasingly effortless. Again, there can be a strong desire to chase the nimitta and shift to it as the object or try to make it merge with the breath. Doing so will dissipate the nimitta and weaken concentration. The process of chasing the nimitta and eventually letting go serves to weaken the hindrance of desire and attachment while cultivating a sense of surrender to the practice as it naturally unfolds, always purifying the mind stream. Landmark 6. Nimitta moves towards emerging with the Anapana spot. When you stay with the breath, crossing the Anapana spot, and do not chase the energized Nimitta, the Nimitta moves closer to the Anapana spot. Without your ex expending any effort, the Nimitta is drawn to the breath at the Anapana spot. As they move 
closer together, stay with the breath, crossing the Anapana spot, and ignore the Nimitta until the Nimitta merges by itself with the breath at the Anapana spot. When you stay with the breath at the Anapana spot and do not chase the Nimitta, the two will eventually merge together in a sudden snap. This merging of the nimitta with the breath happens only when the time is ripe. It is like trying to pet a very shy animal. If you pursue the animal, it flees. If you wait at a safe distance, however, in its own time, the animal comes to you. Landmark 7. Nimitta and Anapana spot merge and become the Anapana nimitta. When ripe, by itself, the breath crossing the Anapana spot and the Nimitta merge into one. We cannot say how this happens, but it does as the mind further unifies. Once the Anapana spot merges with the Nimitta, you then have the Nimitta slash Anapana spot combination as your object. Throughout the remainder of the book, we refer to this merged Nimitta slash Anapana spot as the Anapana Nimitta. This is a new phase of practice and a very exciting one. We both had the Anapana Nimitta break or fade on us several times as we were initially too excited to wait for it to merge on its own. For some people, during this phase, the Anapana Nimitta envelops the entire body. If this happens, let it do so. Just make sure you can still maintain your awareness of it as your meditative object. Over time, the Anapana Nimitta stabilizes. Again, surrender your own agenda and allow the Anapana Nimitta and the jhana factors to strengthen and deepen in their own time. Just stay with your object as always. It is common here to feel excitement, sometimes wondering whether this is the first jhana. Since this is a progression, you can expect to spend a fair amount of time with Anapana Nimitta in access concentration as the mind is being purified uh, before the first material jhana arises. Just remain in silence internally, allowing the practice to do its work. Landmark 8. Anapana Nimitta draws the awareness into first jhana. The Venerable Pak Sayadaw encourages yogis to maintain meditative stability on the Anapana Nimitta continuously for a minimum of 30 minutes. The longer you maintain it, the more stable and focused the concentration is, and then make a resolve to enter first jhana. If the resolve feels like a distraction and you do not want to, want to use one, you can just wait until the concentration is strong enough and then let the jhana arise on its own. Regardless of whether you make a resolve, only when concentration is strong enough will awareness be drawn into the first material jhana. It feels like being physically grabbed by the lapels and pulled face first into the absorption. It is very distinct and unmistakable, quite different from access concentration. If you repeatedly resolve to enter first jhana before the time is ripe, your concentration will wane being more focused on the resolve than on the meditation object, and you will remain in access concentration. While access concentration is very pleasant and serene, with all the jhana factors being present, it is not full absorption to jhana. Skillful effort. In this practice, there is a vital need to understand the concept of effort and how it should be implemented. Most of us living in this modern, fast-paced world find ourselves rewarded for proactively applying our effort to our assignments. We undertake specific action with a particular goal in sight. We use the skills and tools at our disposal to reach the goal while deflecting interference. Our schools and employers have overwhelmingly supported, rewarded, and even taught this approach. Alas, proactive effort is only half of the spectrum of effort in this practice. There is a very fine distinction between proactive effort and receptive effort. Proactive effort is more doing in tone. It is the energy that reaches out into the universe. Receptive effort is more allowing in tone. It is quieter and more inviting. Both energies are necessary in the Samatha practice supporting each other as the practice refines and deepens. Proactive effort. Your task in this timeless practice is to identify, cultivate, and maintain intimacy with the object of meditation. In Anapanasati meditation, this means maintaining your awareness on the breath as it crosses the Anapana spot. Period. 
When the awareness shifts away or falls off the object, gently and non-judgmentally return it. This is proactive effort. It is the doing portion of the practice. Think of the metaphor of driving a car. When you first put a car in motion, you must employ the doing effort of pressing the gas pedal and exerting energy. Once the car picks up speed, you naturally relax the proactive effort and lift your foot off of the gas pedal. If you remove your foot from the gas pedal permanently, the car begins to slow. Now imagine driving down a hill. You don't need to add any productive effort to the car's speed or rate of acceleration. It can coast all by itself. Adding proactive effort at this point is not only unnecessary, it can be counterproductive or even dangerous. In meditation practice, you also need to know when to use more proactive effort and when to let up. You need to apply a lot at the beginning just to stay on your object. If you relax the proactive effort before the awareness is stably on the object, the awareness drifts away from the Anapana spot. This means that you have to let up too soon. This means that you have let up too soon and that you need to place your awareness and attention on the meditative object once again and hold it in place using proactive effort. Conversely, too much proactive effort can turn into striving, which is discussed later in this chapter. Receptive effort. While proactive effort is very familiar to most modern people, it is essential to know that concentration practice will not develop to its deepest level of silence and stillness unless you also cultivate receptive effort. We want to clearly state that you never relax the proactive effort entirely, but you do relax it as much as possible while still exerting enough proactive effort to maintain the awareness on the breath crossing the Anapana spot. When you are at a point of practice where you're able to enjoy some continuity with the meditative object, you can cultivate a sense of ease and allowing sense of receiving that your awareness is resting on the breath at the Anapana spot. This receptive mind posture relaxes your personal grip on the meditative outcome. The initial goal of the practice is simply to maintain awareness of the object. That is your only job at this point. Knowing this, you can relax your proactive effort into a receptiveness, a surrender of your desire for control. When you surrender the stance of personal control, you invite a greater, more universal aspect to join in the process. By engaging receptive effort prop properly, it means you are entering into the flow of the practice, allowing the jhana factors to arise more strongly and draw the awareness deeper. Relinquishing your personal will and inviting this bigger, more universal aspect into your practice is similar to using an oar to propel a boat through the water compared with engaging a small boat motor. You need to engage your own energy in using the oar early in the trip to ensure that you don't run into other objects near the dock. Once your boat is clear, clear of nearby obstacles, you can engage the greater energy of the motor to move more deftly and swiftly through the water. Your receiving effort allows this greater universal aspect to propel the meditation. You will know that when you are using receptiveness and engaging the universal aspect when you begin to experience ease coupled with the arising and increasing of the jhana factors. As the jhana factors begin to arrive, arise, thereby reducing and, ev and eventually extinguishing the hindrances, less and less proactive effort is required to maintain attention on the breath on a pana spot. At first, you need to maintain a good amount of proactive effort. After a while, you can begin to lessen this slightly. As the jhana factors stabilize, the reduction in proactive effort does not lessen the jhana factors intensity and the focus can shift more to receiving. There begins a delicate balance between lessening the proactive effort and increasing the receptive effort that surrenders to allow the jhana factors to strengthen in their own time. The shift also reflects a thinning of the sense of me which becomes vital in progressing through the jhanas. Balancing proactive and receptive. We cannot stress enough the importance of a vigorous initial effort and a deliberate lessening of effort and allowing 
and receiving once the jhana factors gain sufficient strength. You could also think of this as relaxing into the jhana. For jhana to arise, it helps to voluntarily relinquish a sense of control of the process, which in effect, the practice itself takes over. As the jhana factors increase, they take over the primary work of maintaining concentration on the meditative object. The sense of personal will and even of me diminishes naturally because it becomes unnecessary. This is very difficult to communicate. On the one hand, we do not want to encourage you to lessen your effort too soon, since doing so dissipates the concentration that is building by uninterruptedly maintaining the attention on the breath of the Anapana spot. On the other hand, if, you, if your sense of me exerting effort is not reduced at the right time, the power generated by the jhana factors does not take over the bulk of the meditative effort, inviting the nimitta to appear and stabilize. In delicately balancing these energies, the proactive effort gives way to the receptive effort, allowing the more powerful universal aspect to engage in the practice and energize the awareness on the meditation meditative object. If the proactive effort starts to wane, awareness can drift from the meditation meditative object, which reminds you to do a little more and intentionally place the attention on the meditative object. If the receptiveness wanes, a sense of striving can arise, alerting you to relax and let go of your personal agenda. In this way, you balance proactive and receptive effort, and awareness is drawn deeper and deeper into the calm tranquility of concentration. A yogi who enjoys kayaking told us about riding the rail, a term used by kayakers. Riding the rail occurs when kayaking becomes effortless, yet very alive and vibrant. Kayakers ride the rail when they are paddling in, an, in a waterway and seemingly miraculously find the unseen current or movement of the river. The more vigorous effort that a kayaker must expend to keep moving through a still patch of water is no longer necessary. Smaller, more precise strokes are all that's needed to keep the kayak in the very center of the current. In the same way, you can use your awareness of the meditative object to notice when the current of universal energy begins to pull you along. When your awareness is clearly and consistently on the meditative object, then you relax your proactive effort and engage receptive effort, allowing the current to carry the practice along. You are now on the meditative object and at ease staying there, riding the rail of your meditation. Striving. No discussion of effort would be complete without meditative, meditating striving, um, mentioning striving. In this modern world, we are often encouraged to strive and are rewarded for doing so, for applying extra effort to our assigned task. Those of us who are conditioned to be strivers know and likely appreciate the doing of proactive effort. Reg regrettably, an over overly striving approach to this practice is fatal. Uh, nothing will capsize a developing Anapanasati meditation practice quicker than applying too much proactive effort. For example, when a meditator is trying to very intently to see the nimitta, it is easy to try too hard. Whenever there is an end point, it invites the mind to fixate upon that goal. In a desire to reach the end point, the meditator may even believe that he or she is experiencing things that aren't happening. One of the ways we have seen meditators demonstrate striving is in their meditation posture. When striving is strongly present, many meditators begin to lean forward in their chair or on their meditation cushion. It can look like a horse poised to win a race by a nose. There can also be a felt sense of really wanting the next goal or landmark in this practice. It is a kind of grasping, clenching feeling in the mind and body. It feels like a contracted muscle straining to complete a challenging task. If you direct yourself, if you detect yourself falling into striving and over persistence, start by relaxing your posture and bringing your upper body back into a straight line with the lower portion of your body. You might even find it helpful to lean back from the center just slightly 
This can invite the body-mind into greater ease and a posture of acceptance. Incorporating ease into your meditation posture and practice does not necessarily equate to slothfulness or laziness. They arise when there is too little appropriate tension. If you find yourself slouching forward or leaning backwards, indicating too little effort, you should make a subtle adjustment to your posture. For many yogis, adjusting the physical posture also shifts the mental attitude into a supportive and balanced stance. Establishing the proper balance of proactive and receptive effort can seem counterintuitive. We may believe that the harder we press and strain for the prize embedded within the next landmark, the better we are doing, the more we are accomplishing. The proper approach is to focus exclusively on the meditative object while maintaining a balance of the proactive and receptive effort appropriate to the current situation. Relaxing, inviting openness, and surrendering our, deal, our, our ideas and prior experience while remaining alert and focused on our object allows the proper tautness to be present, just as the Buddha reminds us with his analogy of the lute. Sinking Mind at this point in the practice, sinking mind, which is another manifestation of unbalanced energy, can be a problem. This happens when your concentration ex exceeds your physical energy. Because you may be sitting so still for so many hours a day, and the experience of effort has lessened as concentration has increased, this is a delicate time in which balance is helpful. In this regard, walking is another tool that can be used to either increase your energy or settle your state depending on which is needed. For example, when necessary, it is okay to walk at a faster pace in which the physical energy can be elevated rather than the very slow style of walking done in the mindfulness practice as taught in the tradition of the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw. Or, if you feel agitated, you can walk more slowly to settle your energy. In all cases, make sure that you maintain your focus on the breath at the Anapana spot the entire time you are walking. In this chapter, we have discussed the stage that some people find to be the most challenging and difficult of the entire Samatha path, getting through the surf zone of the hindrances to the arising of full absorption into the first jhana. We will next present the four material jhanas, including all casinas, used to complete the practice of the four material jhanas. End of chapter 4. Chapter 5, Material Jhanas 1 through 4 and Related Practices. We will now explore the four material jhanas, jhana mastery, 32 parts of the body meditation, skeleton meditation, and each of the casinas used with the four material jhanas. Specifically, we will discuss what we have found to be the best methods for practicing these meditations to the point of mastery. Absorption, first jhana. Jhana appears only when the conditions for it are ripe. At a beginning jhana, as a beginning jhana practitioner, you cannot force the awareness into full absorption or make it happen. You must be vigilant while relaxing into the process, balancing proactive and receptive effort. Either your awareness is pulled into the jhana spontaneously, or you can use a resolve when you enter a jhana. Do not become discouraged as you focus on the Anapana Nimitta, allowing concentration to build, but also do not become overly zealous and use the resolve repeatedly to the point that your concentration wanes from ex expending too much mental energy on repeating the resolves. You, as you usually know yourself, do not enter jhana. Writing about this experience is therefore awkward because we may use the word you when the experience actually moves from conscious, moves consciousness away from perceptions of identifying with the five aggregates and towards what we call the thinning of the me. In this practice, the veils layered and known as the normal you have been temporarily peeling away. A thinner, gauze-like sense of self is what is absorbed into the jhana. Or into jhana. While you are in jhana, there is an awareness of being in jhana. Uh, it is not an unconscious state. You are aware only of the meditation object. In full absorption, there is no awareness of time, the body, or physical senses. 
However, due to the depth of concentration, the beginning meditator's mind may be able to quickly shift from absorption to access concentration. Fortunately, it is also possible to quickly shift back into jhana absorption, knowing this to be a mere minor imperfection of jhana. In this case, you may have a slight awareness of time, the body, or physical senses. As the practice matures, this awareness will drop, and only awareness of the meditation object will remain. The absorption continues until the jhana factors weaken or the time resolve is reached. After jhana has ended, there remains a deeply felt peace. In our experience, the purified personal sense of consciousness merges into unobstructed, impersonal, universal consciousness. The process of jhana feels as though an ongoing purification has occurred. Each meditative period in jhana removes further impurities in the mind stream. We will not be describing the actual experience of any jhana for two reasons. First, people using this book as a guide may tend to try to duplicate what we experience. Second, each meditator's localized consciousness is slightly different. At this local, localized consciousness enters jhana and is purified through jhana. The experience is unique for each person. Stability. Great contentment accompanies meditative stability. At the retreat we attended, the Venerable Pa'ak Saida required us to remain fully absorbed in various jhanas for two, three, or occasionally even four hours before declaring that we had completed this phase and gained mastery. To the thinking mind, a few hours of meditation sounds challenging yet possible. At first jhana, however, the awareness is so close to normal consciousness that it is quite easy for full absorption to be disrupted. If you are required to stay absorbed in jhana for three hours as one of the five requirements of jhana mastery, and you pop out of jhana after two hours and 50 minutes, that period was insufficient for mastery. Also, if while in jhana you notice the thinking mind making comments, you are out of jhana. You then begin the two or three hour mastery requirement again in your next meditation period. Accordingly, you can expect to do countless meditation periods with first jhana before this time requirement is satisfied. This allows a confidence and familiar stability with each jhana to develop. The Venerable Pa'ak Sayadaw required us to stay in first jhana, completing two to three hours per sitting for a minimum of three days, as well as having the jhana be instantly accessible before moving on to the second jhana. This is because each jhana must be stable before moving on or concentration wanes and is difficult to recover. Subsequent to the first jhana and for all of the casinas, the Venerable Pa'ak Sayadaw required us to be absorbed in each jhana for a minimum of one meditation period of three hours. Should you reach this stage of practice, you will go through the first and all subsequent jhanas each and every time a higher jhana is sought. For example, if you are approaching third jhana for the first time, you enter the first jhana for a brief period, enter second jhana for a brief period, and then open towards third jhana. In this stage of practice, third jhana is never directly entered without going through each previous jhana in turn. While there can be some anticipation about the subsequent jhana, unless you have strong stability in first jhana, you cannot enter second jhana. If you try to enter second jhana too soon, both the first and second jhanas may fade. You would then need to return to the primary object of the breath as it crosses the anapana spot to develop stability with the anapana nimitta before the first jhana will arise again. The jhanas are a purification of awareness. Each level of purification is needed at each jhana before you are ready for the next jhana. As each jhana is mastered, there is an inclination towards the next higher jhana. Ironically, the jhana factors that are unnecessary for the next jhana to begin to feel coarse and burdensome Um, Ironically, the jhana factors that are unnecessary for the next jhana begin to feel coarse and burdensome, like carrying too many pieces of luggage on a trip. Most students are likely to feel satisfied releasing the jhana factors that are no longer needed for the next higher jhana. 
If not, then attachment to that jhana factor is present, and that attachment needs to be purified before moving on. The four material jhanas and associated jhana factors. With each progressive jhana, various jhana factors drop. As the mind purifies and awareness becomes more focused and concentrated, the progression is as follows. Number one, first jhana, vitaka, vikara, piti, sukha, and egat. Egagata. Two. Second jhana. Piti, sukha, and ekagata. Third. Three. Third jhana. Sukha and ekagata. F- four. Fourth jhana. Ekagata and upeka. Five material. Five jhana masteries. On our retreat, the venerable Pa'ak Sayadaw requires us to gain the five masteries in each jhana before moving to the next jhana. The five masteries, which are outlined in the Vasudhimaga, as indicating that the meditator has demonstrated stability and strength in a, predic- in a particular jhana are as follows, one through five. One, to advert or call, direct, call or direct the attention to the jhana factors. Number two to enter jhana whenever desired. Three, to resolve to stay in a jhana for determined duration and to keep the time resolve. Four, to emerge from the jhana at the determined time. Five, to review the jhana factors. Only when the teacher is satisfied that the student has indeed completed the five masteries in connection with full absorption in the first jhana will the student be directed towards the second jhana to direct the attention to the jhana factors. This means directing attention to the jhana factors simply means determining which jhana factors are present at any given time. In doing this, you can feel whether you are likely to be able to enter a particular jhana at that time, to enter the jhana whenever desired. In order to progress to the next higher jhana, you must be able to enter the prior jhana at will. This is one reason why jhana mastery is so important before moving forward in the practice. If you cannot enter the first jhana at will, you will have a hard time being able to move to second jhana and so on. Only when you can easily enter a particular jhana is it, is it stable enough for you to proceed to the next. To resolve to stay in a jhana for determined duration and to keep the time resolved. As we have discussed on our retreat with, with the Sayadaw, required that we progressively increase our time resolves to the point where we could stay in a jhana for either two or three hours without popping out prematurely. This applied, this applied for every jhana using Anapanasati as the object, as well as every casina in every jhana. As with other resolves, when you have attained some stability with a particular jhana, you then resolve before entering the jhana to stay in the specified amount of time. The resolve might be, may I remain in first jhana for three hours. You then enter the jhana. Upon exiting the jhana, after checking the jhana factors as described below, you look at the clock to see whether you met the time resolve. If you did not, then you attempt it again at a later sitting to emerge from jhana at the determined time. If you have met the time resolve as described above, you will emerge at the determined time. This is also important because you don't want to stay in a jhana longer than necessary as you progress in the practice. For example, if you are moving to fourth jhana, you may need to spend only five minutes each in first, second, and third jhanas on your way up the progression. If you cannot reliably enter and exit jhanas in a timely manner, you will spend too long in the prior jhanas and may not meet your time resolve for the next jhana as required. To review the jhana factors, check the bhavanga. Reviewing the jhana factors is important because you want to understand which jhana you are actually experiencing to ensure integrity of the progression. This can only be done by checking the bhavanga to see which jhana factors were present in the prior mind moment. Of all the topics covered here, the bhavanga is one we least understood conceptually. Given that we are not Buddhist scholars, we will focus on explaining how bhavanga is actually used in jhana practice. The bhavanga is located in the heart region. The Venerable Pa'ak Saidao instructs that according to the um, Sunata method, it is also uh, metaphorically called the mind door. 
because mind or cognitive processes such as jhana cognitive processes, including the jhana factors, arise depending on it. When you check the jhana factors, you must first discern that bhavanga mind or when jhana objects such as the anapananimitta appear in that mind door, you can see jhana factors in it because jhana factors arise depending on the mind door. You examine the bhavanga with the wisdom eye after exiting jhana and before entering the next higher jhana to determine which jhana factors are or were present. It is impossible to examine the jhana factors of bhavanga while in jhana because in jhana there is no volition or thinking. When you are checking the jhana factors, you are in access concentration, not absorption. Somehow, following the time when the student is first able to enter jhana, the ability to discern the jhana factors in the bhavanga seems to emerge naturally. We had no idea how this would occur when we first heard about it at the retreat. We thought it might be impossible to see into the bhavanga with the wisdom eye. Yet with the wisdom eye functioning, the jhana factors can be seen in the bhavanga. Once your awareness is stable within a jhana, the instruction is to look very briefly with the wisdom eye after exiting the jhana to determine whether you can see into the bhavanga. After the next sitting, at its end, check briefly whether you can see each of the five jhana factors, vitaka, vikara, piti, sukha, and egagata in the bhavanga. Only at this time do you attempt the remaining four masteries. At the end of that sitting, again, check the bhavanga to see whether the five jhana factors were present. At a later sitting, you can attempt all five masteries and then check all five jhana factors at once as a unified whole. In all these cases, you are not looking with the normal eyes towards the heart area to see the bhavanga. The wisdom eye develops through the process of purification of mind and becomes quite powerful as a result of the bright energy of intense concentration. Reviewing the jhana factors in the bhavanga is required to master each of the subsequent jhanas as well. Second jhana. Following attainment of the five jhana masteries in the first jhana, the teacher instructs the student to proceed to second jhana. Having attained the five masteries of first jhana, we found that we were instinctively oriented towards second jhana. The second jhana has piti, sukha, and egagata as its jhana factors. It does not have vitaka or vichara as they have dropped away. Return to the anapana nimitta in meditation. If the nimitta is not present, continue focusing on the breath crossing the anapana spot until Anapana Nimitta again arises. Usually, if you have entered first jhana, the Anapana Nimitta is readily available. Presuming outer and inner talk, remain silent and the attention on the object is ongoing. Shortly after you start with your attention on the breath crossing the Anapana spot, the Anapana Nimitta appears strong and clearly present. Then, cultivate the first five jhana factors, Vitaka, Initial application, vikara, sustained application, piti, rapture, sukha, bliss, and ekagata, single pointedness, and enter the first jhana. Always enter first jhana before proceeding to the second jhana. In this stage of practice, at no time do you jump over any jhana, meaning you do not start with third jhana without having proceeded through the first jhana and second jhana. On the first attempt, do, do first jhana for an extended period until it is stable, and then make a resolve for second jhana. Later, you can spend only a few minutes in first jhana and then go on to second jhana. When you enter second jhana, two of the jhana factors of, of first jhana, vitaka and vichara, drop away. The jhana factors that are unnecessary for successively higher jhanas drop upon entering the higher jhana. Again, when you're ready, a resolve is made, and if concentration is strong and the time is ripe, awareness is drawn into second jhana. Interestingly, each jhana has a feel, a flavor, or an intuitive taste that is different from the other jhanas. 
with time and practice, you may learn to experientially distinguish which jhana is present. You should quickly review the bhavanga after exiting jhana to determine which jhana factors are present in that jhana. This confirms which jhana was entered. Again, at a retreat, the Venerable Pa Oxide required jhana mastery of the second jhana. This means spending three continuous hours in the second jhana during one period of meditation. In other words, the mastery requirements cannot be satisfied by, say, being in second jhana for one hour during one meditation period and for two hours during another meditation period and adding them together. Jhana stability, meaning f meaning fulfilling the five jhana masteries, is required to fully experience each jhana and to have the purification and jhana energy to proceed with stability to the next higher jhana. Once the five jhana masteries are achieved in the second jhana, you are directed to the third jhana. Third jhana. The third jhana has only sukha and egagata as its jhana factors. Continue focusing on the anapananimitta. If the anapananimitta is not available, focus on the breath crossing the anapana spot until the nimitta appears and merges with the spot. Proceed to once again enter and exit the first and second jhanas as before. The time, time spent in the first and second jhana is brief. As soon as you feel the stability and bright clear energy of the first jhana, exit first jhana. Upon full absorption in the second jhana, Vitaka and Vitara, Vikara drop as they are unnecessary for second jhana. Pity is a mental state that produces a corresponding bodily sensation of happiness almost as an excitement. As before, when opening to third jhana, the jhana factors of second jhana feel unnecessary, almost a burden. Sukha, as a, as a deep feeling of bliss, is very appropriate when developing the third jhana factors. Egagata is unified, focused awareness. The meditative attention and awareness unify. No extra effort is exerted. Awareness is drawn into third jhana with the jhana factors of Sukha and Egagata. The third jhana feels more refined and pure than the second jhana. Each successively higher jhana is easy, easier to maintain as it is further from ordinary consciousness, so the senses are less easily distracted. We found each jhana to be independently wonderful. Although each jhana was very satisfying, once the five jhana masteries were achieved, there was an obvious movement almost an attraction towards the next higher jhana. Fourth jhana. Once the five jhana masteries have been reached, with the third jhana proceed to the fourth jhana. Begin by discarding and turning away from sukha, as it is no longer necessary for the first, first jhana. For the fourth jhana, sukha is replaced from the fourth jhana, though the four immaterial jhanas by upeka equanimity. Or, as concentration focuses into one-pointedness and equanimity, sukha can begin to wane on its own. Fourth jhana has ekagata, one-pointedness, and upeka, equanimity, as its jhana factors. Upeka replaces sukha as a more refined and less gross, mentally produced feeling state, which will be present throughout the rest of the jhanas. Focus on the anapananimitta and enter first jhana, with its five jhana factors, Vitaka, Vichara, Piti, Sukha, and Egagata. After a few minutes in the stability of first jhana, exit the first jhana and enter the second jhana. With the factors of second jhana, Piti, Sukha, and Egagata, then when stability in the second jhana is reached for a few minutes, exit second jhana and use the nimitta to enter third jhana. The third jhana factors, sukha and egagata, are present prior to entering third jhana. The first time fourth jhana is attempted, you may stay in third jhana for an extended period to ensure stability. Over time, a brief stay is all that's needed to confirm the stability and energy of the third jhana as with the prior two jhanas. Exit third jhana and feel the inclination towards Egagata and Upeka. Egagata and Upeka feel 
very full, grounded, and satisfying without having a quality of excitement, as in the second and third jhanas. Stephen, S- Stephen recalls anticipating that he would find that dropping of sukha to be difficult because of its pleasurable quality. When moving towards fourth jhana, though, sukha feels unnecessary. The one-pointedness, ekagata, and equanimity, upeka, are very complete. It is very difficult to be distracted when meditating with ekagata and upeka. When these two jhana factors are strong and the nimitta is powerful, awareness is drawn into fourth jhana. The shift from third jhana to fourth jhana is significant. Moving from first jhana to second jhana or from second jhana to third jhana represents a slight change in jhana factors. Experientially, these first three material jhanas feel more similar to one another. You must be willing to set aside all the joyous and blissful bodily sensations produced by the mental states of pity and sukha in the first three jhanas to focus on egagata and upeka in the fourth jhana. While some people may presume that the fourth jhana is more challenging because the bliss is much more subtle and impersonal, it is available by trusting the teachings and not just seeking pleasurable experiences. Being willing to develop agagata and upeka to the exclusion of the other jhana factors is natural after mastering third jhana. By the time a meditator is close to entering fourth jhana, the normal breath has become very, very shallow and subtle. The, the Vasudhi Maga states that the breath stops in the fourth jhana. Experientially, it feels as though it has stopped. What is important is not to be concerned about this issue. Any attention to whether there is, in fact, breath diverts the meditative concentration, making fourth jhana unavailable. Specifically, there can be a bodily felt sense of fright when meditating with the nimitta as fourth jhana ripens. This is because the body senses there is insufficient, insufficient oxygen to live. Resist the urge to take a deep breath to pacify this fright. A deep breath at this time disrupts the development of Egagata and Upeka, and fourth jhana, jhana drifts further away. The fear of having insufficient breath does, in fact, pass. Allow it to do so. Check the jhana factors and access concentration and make the resolve for fourth jhana. Alternatively, when ripe, the deep concentration draws the awareness into fourth jhana. Proceed as before to obtain the five jhana masteries for fourth jhana. Further practices with the material jhanas. Once the first four jhanas are stable, you and the teacher may agree that you should go on to additional samatha practices. In this case, you will do the following meditative practices in the following order. 1. 32 body parts meditation. 2. Skeleton meditation. 3. White casino. All the casino meditations are initially completed upon attaining the first through fourth jhanas using each progressive casino as the object. 4. Nila, brown slash black slash blue casino. 5. Yellow casino. 6. Red casino. 7. Earth casino. 8. Water casino. 9. Fire casino. 10. Wind casino. 11. Light casino. 12. Space casino. Casino. We will now review the 32 body parts meditation, skeleton meditation, and all casino meditations through the fourth jhana in turn. 32 body parts meditation. Once you have attained jhana mastery of the fourth jhana using Anapanasati meditation, the teacher will direct you to practice 32 body parts meditation. This meditation is undertaken to further loosen your identification with the body, which allows for less attachment to materiality and self-identity as jhana practice develops towards the immaterial jhanas. It also lays the foundation for non-attachment to the body in order to see the rupa kalapas later in the vipassana practice. Rupa kalapas are the subatomic particles that are the basis of all materiality. They are described in chapter 8, which presents the four elements meditation. Here's a quick review. First, enter and pass through the first, second, third, and fourth jhanas using the Anapana Nimitta as, as the object. Experience each of the four material jhanas with the corresponding jhana factors. Complete the five jhana masteries for each jhana. 
quickly check the bhavanga after exiting each jhana to ensure that the corresponding jhana factors were present in that particular jhana. Exit each jhana only when the stability and jhana energy are strongly experienced. Once out of the fourth jhana, direct the strong, clear, bright energy of unified awareness, the wisdom eye, to the body as described below. The body parts are listed in groups because at a later point you will discern them together in these groups. Earth Element Parts Body Parts 1 through 5 Head Hairs, Body Hairs, Nails, Teeth, Skin Body Parts 6 through 10 Flesh, Sinews, Bones, Bone Marrow, and Kidneys Body Parts 11 through 15 Heart, Liver, Membranes, spleen and lungs body parts 16 through 20 intestines mesonary this connects the small intest intestines to the abdominal wall undigested food feces and brain water element parts body parts one through six bile phlegm pus blood sweat and fat body parts 11 through 12 tears Grease, saliva, snot, synovial fluid, this lubricates the joints, and urine. Ideally, locate each part, such as the head hairs, with the wisdom eye and observe it internally. Carefully examine and deeply know each part so you can know it in the body in one instant. Should the brightness of concentrated awareness fade during this practice, Go back to the jhanas using the Anapananimitta as the object, progressing through the first, second, third, and fourth jhanas for a meditation period to reestablish strong concentration. Then resume the 32 body parts meditation. See each body part very clearly. You should know characteristics such as the location, color, and contour before passing on to the next body part. For example, discern the blood everywhere in the body at once with your eyes closed. Experientially know the flow, pressure, and color of the blood within the body. Actually, see these with the wisdom eye. Once you can easily locate each earth element body part in your own body, attempt to see all the body parts one through five together as a unit. You will eventually do this for each group of body parts in the earth element and water element. When you can see with the jhana energized wisdom eye all the elements of earth and water discreetly and as subgroups look at the earth element group then the water element group as a whole when you have learned to do this quickly and thoroughly see the earth element and water element groups together viewing each element separately and as a unit of either earth or water, as well as the whole of the 32 body parts meditation. Although this sounds challenging, with the powerful concentration functioning as the wisdom eye, it is possible. After you see all distinct body parts exhaustively with the wisdom eye and can experience them distinctly and together as once, try to see each distinct body part in somebody else someone else usually someone nearby in the meditation hall try to see each distant part in the other using the wisdom eye uh, try to see each distinct part in the other using the wisdom eye sometimes with the eyes open and other times with the eyes closed once you have done this successfully continue with every person animal or other being in the world again if you begin to lose energy while completing the 32 body parts meditation go through the full four material jhanas using the anapananimitta as the object and then return to the 32 body parts meditation eventually you become able to discern every being human animal or other in all directions as the 32 body parts earth element and water elements and combine as one of 32 body parts meditation when this has been completed you will move on to the skeleton meditation this may sound as if it would take weeks or months to complete but due to the strong concentration produced by the jhanas it took us about two days to complete while the time it takes may vary from student to student the point is that it is sometimes possible to move quickly due to the laser-like clarity powered by the jhanas skeleton meditation 
pass through the first, second, third, and fourth jhanas using the Anapananimitta as the object in preparation for skeleton meditation. This is done to maintain the brilliant concentration. Next, direct the wisdom eye to the bones of your own skeleton. Since you previously saw your own skeleton in the course of the 32 body parts meditation, returning to this practice is fairly effortless. The skeleton is seen as a whole. Look for color variation, breaks and cracks in the bones. Hold this sight with the wisdom eye during meditation. After seeing the skeleton in its entirety in one instant, develop a feeling of repulsion towards the skeleton. Repulsiveness, patikula or asuba, is used in various meditations to loosen the identification with materiality and self-identity. We develop this repulsion towards our own body because this is loosening of the identification with the body faculties, successfully entering the casinas and upper immaterial jhanas. Look with the wisdom eye for the frailties of the skeleton. As repulsion towards the skeleton strengthens, the mental image of the skeleton eventually ceases and the skeleton as a physical identity drops away. The sense of the repulsiveness of the skeleton then remains as the meditative object. As the strength of this repulsive meditation develops, first jhana can arise using the repulsiveness of the skeleton as the meditative object. Look exhaustively to see the skeleton as repulsive in your own body. When you are successful, see the skeleton as repulsive in another person with your eyes closed. Repeat this with others until you can quickly move your attention from person to person and see only the repulsiveness of the skeleton. Once you have satisfactory satisfactorily accomplish this, see the skeleton as repulsive in every body in all directions throughout the world. Seeing the skeleton clearly in this meditation is helpful as this can be the entry point into the white casino later. Also, this meditation helps to further relax your identification with the physical body. The, in the immaterial jhanas, the yogi's personal localized consciousness must be free to absorb into the more impersonal consciousness of each upper jhana. Once you have completed skeleton meditation, you are ready for white casino practice. Casinas. Casinas are disc-like images of various colors or elements used as objects of meditation. The meditator enters the jhanas using the different casinas, each of which has a distinct flavor of experience. Progressing through the casinas in the following order allows a further thinning and purifying of the meditator's consciousness. The casinas are undertaken in this specific order because each progressive casina is more refined and insubstantial as a meditative object. This prepares the meditator for the subtle objects of meditation in the upper immaterial jhanas. Also, with each subsequent casina, the meditator's awareness becomes more purified, more refined, and less dense. This is preparing the awareness to enter the immaterial jhanas. Finding the proper color for the color casinos can be tricky. You can use the various colors in the body as witnessed in the 32 body parts meditation. Using the meditator's own body parts is the traditional instruction. In ancient times, this has undoubtedly made the practice easier because the color was always available to the meditator. However, if you prefer, you can also use the colors of nature such as flower, soils, trees, and clouds. In either case, you have located the optimal color when you close your eyes and can see the color clearly and distinctly in your mind's eye. Alternately, if using an object in nature, first observe the color with eyes open. When you can see the color very clearly with eyes shut, you can commence this casino meditation for that specific color. Meditative procedure for each casino in the material jhanas 1 through 4. The process is the same for each casino through the first, second, third, and fourth jhanas. Before you try to take an external object for a casino, such as Earth Casino, casino enter the first, second, third, and fourth jhanas, preferably using the Anapana Nimitta or White Casino as the object. Emerging from the fourth jhana, the mind is very concentrated and powerful, thus making the task of taking a casino as an object, such as Earth Casino, much easier.
Once you're proficient with a casino, you need only pay attention to a previous casino image for the nimitta to arise. Locate the proper color for the casino you are undertaking. You can use the color or other characteristics, earth, water, fire, and so on, of the specific casino as the meditative object when you can see it with eyes closed. When the jhana factors are strengthening, the casino becomes energized and clearly visible. When you can sense, uh, you can sense when the casino becomes stable, as you did with the Anapana Nimitta previously. The casino is available whenever you close your eyes, even if only for a moment. Once the image of the casino is stable and energized, begin to expand the casino. The casino may expand on its own. If not, use a subtle intention to expand the casino. Expand the casino a few inches at a time. Should the casino become thin or should you see apparent holes in the casino with the wisdom eye, the casino has not has been expanded too quickly. Use a subtle intention to retract the casino to a smaller size that feels more stable and cohesive. Meditate upon the casino as an object until it is stable and the jhana factors are energized. The jhana factors increase as the meditation deepens. As the jhana factors become stronger, the casino can eventually be expanded to encompass the entire world, including you. Up to this point, while focusing on the casino, the concentration is at the level of access concentration. When the endless casino image is independently stable and bright, focus on a small spot on the expanded casino. This spot becomes the new object of meditation. This is like looking into the open, expansive sky and being fixed upon fixated upon a specific particular spot. When meditative concentration is strong and all the jhana factors needed for that jhana are strong, the spot on the casino draws awareness into first jhana. Complete all five jhana masteries for the first jhana using a particular casino as an object. Then progress to the next successively higher material jhana to complete all four material jhanas and the five masteries in each, using that casino as an object. We will refer back to this process with each casino rather than laboriously re restarting, restating it for each jhana in each casino. Again, the sequence for initial, initially cultivating the casinas is as followed. White casino, Nila casino, um, three yellow casino, four red casino, Five Earth Casino, six Water Casino, seven Fire Casino, eight Wind Casino, nine Light Casino, and ten Space Casino. White Casino. To start White Casino practice, go through the first, second, third, and fourth jhanas using the Anapana Nimitta as the object. Then quickly undertake and complete the thirty-two body parts meditation. See the skeleton separately from the other parts of the 32 body parts meditation and take it as the meditative object. Use the wisdom eye to locate the whitest part of the skeleton. Often the back of the skull is used as the meditative object given its color, size, and round shaped shape resembling a disc. Take the whiteness of the back of the skull or a different part of the skeleton as the meditative object. See the white color taken from the back of the skull where the nimitta previously appeared, with your eyes closed. If you cannot find the proper white to be taken as an object from your own body, use the white from an object in nature, a cloud or other source, source such as a flower. It needs to be white that intuitively feels like the right color. From the strength of the fourth jhana, the factors for first jhana, vitaka, vachara, piti, sukha, and agata begin to arise. At this time, the white held as the object begins to take the form of a disc. A white disc is then the natural object of meditation. This white object becomes a stable meditative object. The stability of the casino becomes apparent through the independently energized bright white casino. Expand the casino to encompass the entire world. This may happen with no effort on your part. If the casino does not automatically expand, expand it in each meditation period using subtle intention. At this point, there is white in every direction as far as the wisdom I can see. 
See, the vast whiteness includes you. When the expanded white is everywhere and that object is stable, choose a specific point in the white upon which to place your attention. Over time, your meditative attention effortlessly locks onto a specific small pot spot on the expanded casino. All this, although this may sound strange to the thinking mind, it, this is quite comfortable to do. The meditative attention falls naturally on a specific spot on the expanded white casino, and that becomes the new meditative object. Eventually, as the jhana factors increase, this spot on the expanded white casino draws awareness into jhana. Al alternatively, you can make a resolve for jhana. Using the same process as before, progress to the first, second, third, and fourth jhanas. Using white casino as an object, discerning the jhana factors after each meditation period in jhana, and staying with the particular jhana until the five masteries of, for each jhana have been achieved. Again, if you try to move to the next jhana or casino without fully gaining all the five jhana masteries in each of the four material jhanas using that particular casino, it is difficult, if not impossible, to take the next casino in the sequence as an object and have it be stable enough for jhana. Patient, persistent practice with each jhana is needed to continue working through the casinos. After a white casino is used to enter the four jhanas, the white casino now becomes the beginning meditative object for the remaining casinos. This means that at the start of each meditation period, you intentionally see the white casino. Once the white casino is stable and energized, expand it until the jhana factors for first jhana are strong. Allow your awareness to be drawn to a spot on the expanded white color. The spot chosen on the fully expanded white color draws attention into first jhana. Pass through each of the first four jhanas using white casino as an object prior to starting a new casino. Nila or brown, black, blue casino. The Nila casino is a color likened to brown blue, black, or a combination of the three. You may find that you have an affinity with one of these colors or the blended color of Nila. Nila is based on the blue black of black head hair or the color of bile from the 32 body parts meditation. If neither of these is the right color for you, then use an object in nature. We found that a color closest to those found on or in the human body was best for us. Once again, undertake each jhana using Nila Casina as an object until you attain the five masteries for each jhana. Discern the appropriate jhana factors with the wisdom eye in the bhavanga after each meditation period in each successive jhana when the five jhana masteries are achieved achieved approach and cultivate the next jhana as discussed earlier in this chapter in the meditative pr procedure for each casino in the material jhanas section when you have successfully attained jhana mastery in the fourth jhana using the nila casino as an object you are ready for yellow casino yellow casino the Venerable Pa'oxide usually suggests that students use their urine as the yellow color for yellow casino. If this works, great. If not, then find a yellow flower or some other object in nature that has the color you feel intuitively to be the proper yellow casino color for this meditation. You can confirm that you have located the correct shade of yellow when you can easily see it for an extended period of time with eyes shut. Proceed through each of the four jhanas using white casino as an object with its corresponding jhana factors. After completing all four jhanas using white casino, develop nila casino. Next, pass through each jhana with its appropriate jhana factors using nila casino as an object. Check the bhavanga with the wisdom eye after each jhana to ensure the proper jhana factors are done. Next, focus on the yellow casino until the first jhana factors, vitaka, initial application, vikara. Sustained attention, pity, rapture, sukha, bliss, egagata, one pointedness arise. When concentration is strong enough, awareness is drawn into first jhana using yellow casino as an object. Proceed with each of the four jhanas as with the prior casinas, gaining the five masteries with each jhana. Once the five jhana masteries are attained with the fourth jhana using yellow casino as an object, move to red casino. Red casino. Next, seek a shade of red that intuitively feels like a, the right red color for a meditative object. The Venerable Pa'oxide now recommends using the color of the student's blood as seen in the 32 body parts meditation. If the color of your blood does not come easily, 
does not easily become the color red for the casita meditation, you can find the proper color in nature, possibly a flower. There is no logical way to know the right shade of red. When you see the correct red for this meditation, you will know it. As before, take the red color as your meditative object. See it when your eyes are closed in the same way as the colors white, nila, and yellow for those casinas. If the red color fades before becoming independently stable, open your eyes to observe the red being used for the casino color. When you can see the red color with eyes closed, resume the meditation period. Once the red color has become the casino, uh, proceed as before with expanding the red casino. Follow the same pattern as with the prior casinas. When you have attained the five jhana masteries for all four jhanas using red casino as an object, develop earth casino. Earth Casina. We are now moving from color casinas to casinas based on the else. We speculate that while the color casino meditations are based on body parts and purify various energies and perceptions of the body, the elements casino meditations purify perception of the elements that make up the other aspects of materiality, our environment. In preparing for Earth Casina, find dirt whose color represents the image of earth to you. Note, this is earth as in dirt, not as in the image of the globe that fits in space. If you want, collect a small amount of this dirt in a container. Alternately, you can draw a circle on the ground outside and gaze at it for some minutes to imprint the visual image of earth. Initially, observe the dirt with eyes with open eyes. Eventually, you will need to hold the image of earth independently as a meditative object when your eyes are closed. The image is then the meditative object for earth casino. As you progress through the remaining casinas, the image of a casina is the meditative object for the particular casina. This prepares you to hold increasingly subtle casinas as objects, as well as even more subtle meditative objects found in immaterial jhanas. When you can see and hold the earth image as a meditative object, earth casina meditation begins. With time, the jhana factors arise for the first jhana, and the earth casino becomes stable and energized inter inter independently. Proceed to expand the earth casino to cover the entire world, world including you. Allow your meditative attention to fall upon a small point on the expanded earth casino, and through this spot enter first jhana. Following the same progression as with the prior casinas, proceed through each of the first four jhanas. Following the same progression as with the prior casinas, complete each of the first through fourth jhanas to the point of the five jhana mass using earth casino as an object. You are then ready for water casino. Water casino. Observe a bowl of water to develop water casino as a meditative object. When you can discern the water with eyes closed, take it as the object of meditation. If while you are meditating, the object slips away, resume staring at the bowl of water with open eyes to recapture its image as a meditative object. When you begin to perceive water with eyes closed, water becomes the focus of meditation until it becomes a casino. The five jhana factors arise. Proceed to expand the water casino to cover the entire world, including you. Allow your meditative attention to fall upon a small point on the expanded water casino and, through this spot, enter the first jhana, following the same progression as with the prior casinos. When you have attained the five jhana masteries in each of the first, second, third, and fourth jhana, using water casino as an object, you are ready for fire casino. Fire casino. To obtain fire as an object of meditation, use a candle or some other small flame. Observe the flame open-eyed. Even though fire moves, it is possible to see it as a stable image with eyes closed. If you cannot see the object with the eyes closed, return to observing the fire open-eyed. Once you can clearly see the object as a casino with eyes closed and the five jhana factors have arisen, the fire casino appears stable and energized. Expand the fire casinos before to include the entire world as well as you. Again, allow the meditative attention to fall naturally upon a small point on the expanded fire casino. Take this spot as a meditative object, drawing awareness into first jhana. When you have attained the five jhana masteries in the first jhana using fire casino as an object, proceed with the casino jhana progression outlined above. 
Once you have attained the five jhana masteries for second, third, and fourth jhanas using fire casino as object, proceed with developing wind casino. Wind casino. Taking wind as an object is difficult to understand conceptually. This is why cultivating the prior elements casino is helpful. First, find a place where wind is blowing. Wind can be observed in a window, doorway, or outside blowing in bushes and trees. You can also feel the wind on your skin. If you can see an image of wind in your mind's eye, that can be taken as an object. Take wind as the object of meditation. Wind becomes a casino. As the jhana factors arise, the casino becomes stable and energized. Expand this energized casino until it fills the entire world, including you. When this expanded wind casino is stable, the meditative attention is drawn to a small point on the expanded casino. When the jhana factors are of significant strength, awareness is drawn in the first jhana. The five jhana masteries for the first jhana need to be obtained before moving on to second jhana using wind casino as an object. The steps for the subsequent jhanas are outlined above. Once you have attained the five jhana mastery of the first, second, third, and fourth jhanas using wind casino as an object, proceed to light casino. Light casino. The object for this casino is light. To obtain light as a meditative object, observe light streaming through a window or doorway. Focus on the beam of light, but not the particles that the light catches in the air. When clear morning sun is available, you can use the sun disk as a light casino object. Other times, the sunlight that shines between the tree branches or leaves may be suitable to use as a light casino object. When closing your eyes, observe what remains as light. When you can detect light with eyes closed, take light as the meditative object. As the jhana factors arise, light becomes a casino. With further meditation, the light casino becomes stable and independently energized. If the stable light casino does not expand on its own, expand it to cover the entire world, including you. When this expanded light casino is stable, the meditative attention falls upon a small point on the expanded light casino. When all jhana factors are sufficiently strong and the time is ripe, ripe awareness is drawn into first jhana. Follow the progression outlined as above to obtain the five jhana masteries for second, third, and fourth jhanas using light casino as an object. This includes checking the bhavanga with the wisdom eye for the corresponding jhana factors after exiting each jhana. When the jhana, five jhana masteries have been attained for the first, second, third, and fourth jhanas using light casino as an object, proceed to space casino. Space casino. When we observe the stars, what we see between them is space. This can then be used as the basis for the space casino as an object. Another option is to hold a round circle against a clear sky. Pay attention to the space within the circle. Space is then held as a meditative object with eyes closed. As the jhana factors arise, space becomes a casino. Continue with meditation on the space casino. When the jhana factors and meditative concentration are sufficiently, sufficiently strong, the casino becomes stable and inter, independently energized. Expand the space casino to cover the entire world, including you. After the expanded space casino stabilizes, the meditative attention shifts to a small point on the expanded space casino. In time, awareness enters first jhana. Once the five jhana masteries are obtained in the first jhana using space casino as an object, follow the progression outlined in the meditative procedure for each casino in the material jhanas. Casino section to gain the five jhana masteries for the second, third, fourth jhanas using space casino as an object. Although still in the material realm, Space Casino is approaching the immaterial realms slash jhanas. There is a qualitative difference in the progression of casinas as each new casino is more refined, subtle, and delicate as an additive object. You can see this, for example, from the fact that Earth is much more dense than space. With each lighter and subtler casino, your localized consciousness is being refined and purified, which prepares your awareness to approach the immaterial realms of the upper jhanas. 
The use of the casinas as objects of meditation is another example of the Buddha's genius. We found that as we progressed through the ten casinas, everywhere we looked around us became a trigger for the pristine awareness of the jhanas. The colors of the world as well as the images of the elements became supports to ongoing practice and continuity. The base meditation object and recharging concentration. During practice of the casinas, for some people, the base meditative object sometimes shifts from the Anapananimata to the white casina. This is the object that uses your home base to launch into high-level meditative object. You also use it as your object while you're moving around. The Venerable Pa'ak Sidao instructs that you can make this shift and use a white casina as the object while moving around in the world, or continue to use the Anapanimita as the base meditative object. We are eating, walking, and so on, whichever works better for you. It can be helpful to use white casina as a base because the earth casino will be used repeatedly in the upper immaterial jhanas to access the base of boundless space, the fifth jhana. While it is possible to go straight to the earth casino, for most people white casino is an easier starting point given its similarity to the Anapanimita and its ability to be seen even while moving around, walking, eating, and so on. Because Earth Casina is difficult to take as a base for many reasons, including its darker color, it is not recommended. The Anapananima is another alternative. However, it begins to feel somewhat gross compared to the White Casina at this point in the practice, which for some meditators makes White Casina more useful. Stephen found that he preferred to use the Anapananimita as a meditative base while walking, eating, and the like. When he sat for formal meditation, White Casina arose naturally and provided easy access to Earth Casina. Tina found that the White Casina arose naturally as an ongoing base at this point. However, over the many days of progressing through all the lower jhanas and casinas, it was beneficial for her to return to the Anapananimita periodically to charge up the concentration. Especially before moving on from one casino to another, it is important to have strong concentration. Therefore, returning to a meditation period with the Anapananimita as the object can be worthwhile and even prevent the progression from wobbling because the Anapananimita has the ever-present physical sensation of the breath. It is always easily accessible. Alternately, al alternatively, when you are undertaking a sitting period and progressing through the several jhanas as you move to higher to the higher casinas, spending a few extra minutes in the first jhana with Anapananimita can also create the jhana rocket fuel necessary to maintain a solid progression. We have now reviewed all the meditative practices through the fourth material jhana. It is time to continue our journey into the four upper jhanas, the immaterial states that provide gateways to direct perception of the space that holds all material, the boundless consciousness that holds all space, a realm in which absolutely no thing is present, and that which is beyond all these. End of chapter 5. Chapter 6, Immaterial Jhanas 5-8 through eight, and Related Practices For awareness to be absorbed into immaterial jhanas is among the most delicate of Buddhist practice and subtle meditation. The realms traversed are breathtaking in their vastness and sheer depth of being. Infinite space, unbounded conscious, consciousness, no thingness in that which is beyond. This is the train presented here. The objects of meditation in these immaterial realms are too insubstantial for imagination. Fortunately, they can be experienced directly. The four immaterial jhanas are 1. The base of boundless space, the fifth jhana. 2. The base of boundless consciousness, the sixth jhana. 3. The base of nothingness, the seventh jhana. And 4. The base of neither perception nor non-perception, the eighth jhana. In some texts, these meditations are not referred to as jhanas because they are thought not to be true absorptions. Rather, it is thought that they are actual, objective, non-material, formless realms that are accessed by awareness through the gateway of the meditative object. The laser-like concentration developed in the lower jhanas and casinas become the key to open these gateways to the immaterial realms. 
our experience was that they do indeed experientially feel more like immaterial realms than meditative absorptions. However, because there is a progression of practice, and for the ease of language, we will refer to them primarily as immaterial jhanas and only occasionally as immaterial states or realms. If you are able to attain the five jhana masters for each of the first four material jhanas using each of the ten casinas as an object, the teacher may next direct you to the immaterial jhanas. When we when we taught with the Venerable Pa'aksaida on a retreat at the Forest Refuge, we learned that he sometimes directs students to the four elements of meditation after they complete the first through four jhana, fourth jhanas. He does not instruct everyone to go on to the upper jhanas. The direction on which way to proceed is based on a combination of the student's meditative ability and capacity, the student's intention to practice, and the remaining retreat time available. Attainment of the fourth jhana provides a solid level of concentration which which to undertake the vipassana practice. However, the Saidao instructed us that undertaking vipassana with the power of all eight jhanas was most desirable in order to achieve the greatest depth and thoroughness of insight. In completing the casino meditations, the meditator discovers and utilizes each of the ten casinas as a meditative object for each material jhana. Each successive casino as the object for accessing the material jhanas is lighter in appearance and more delic delicately subtle in its essence. Those who complete these practices have spent a minimum of three uninterrupted hours in each of the four material jhanas for each of the ten casinas. Usually, several attempts have been made before time mastery is achieved. This is an enormous amount of time to spend fully absorbed in the jhanas and in access concentration leading to absorption. The meditative concentration has become stronger and increasingly subtle, focused, and laser-like. Also, moving from casino to casino and developing the specific jhana factors for each of the four material jhanas with each casino demands the development of tremendous meditative skill and flexibility of mind and promotes a nearly continuous purification of mind. Building progressive concentration on this number of objects and attaining the five masteries in each provides a solid foundation from which to attempt to access the immaterial realms. Most meditators go on to the immaterial jhanas will start by using the white casino as the beginning object and then move to earth casino, which provides access to the base of boundless space. The jhana factors for the fourth material jhana, Egagata and Upeka, remain the same for each of the immaterial jhanas. Once you have progressed through each of the material jhanas using this method and have attained the five jhana masteries in each immaterial jhana, you will use all the other casinas to also progress through the immaterial jhanas, with the exception of space casina. Space casina cannot be used because of its relationship to the base of boundless space, the fifth jhana. Space cannot be used as a casina to enter space as an immaterial state. The five jhana masteries are also attained for each casina in each upper jhana as they were in the four material jhanas. The casinas used to experience the immaterial jhanas are in a different order than the four than for the lower four material jhanas. The order of the casina is changed for the immaterial jhanas to continuously refine and purify the student's consciousness. As you can see, in this case, the casina progression from more dense to less dense to make the transition easier and to increase the refinement as the practice progresses. The order of the casinas in the immaterial jhanas is 1. Earth Casina 2. Water Casina 3. Fire Casina 4. Wind Casina 5. Nila Casina 6. Yellow Casina 7. Red Casina 8. White Casina and 9. Light Casina Base of Boundless Space, the fifth jhana. Proceeding from the base meditative object of either the Anapana Nimitta or the White Casina, take Earth Casina as meditative object. If Earth Casina is difficult to see as an object for first jhana, return to White Casina practice. Take White Casina as a meditative object and cult of the jhana factors for the first jhana. Vitaka, initial application, Vikara, sustained application, Pitti, rupture, Sukha, Bliss, and Ekagata, one-pointed. Proceed through the first, second, third, and fourth jhanas using White Casina 
as an object remain in each until you reach stability in the five jhana masteries. At this point, st stability in the lower four jhanas is likely to be established in 30 minutes or less. When earth casino can be taken as a meditative object and the jhana factors are cultivated, enter first jhana. When stability is reached in first jhana, use earth casino as an object, move to second jhana with the jhana factors of piti, sukha, and agagata. And with earth Kasina as the meditative object. When second jhana stabilized, continue to third jhana with sukha and agata as the jhana. When third jhana has stabilized, move to the fourth jhana with the jhana factors of agagata and upeka. Enter the experience stability in the fourth jhana using earth kasina as it. While in access concentration near fourth jhana, using earth kasina as an object, Direct your awareness to the space-expanded Earth Casina occupies. Direct your awareness to the space the expanded Earth Casina occupies. This is sometimes accomplished by either seeing minute holes in the Earth Casina or an edge of the Earth Casina, a seam where space and the Earth Casina meet. Stephen, Stephen found applying attention to the edge of the Earth Casina easier. Tina found the holes method easier. By focusing on either the small holes in the casino or the edge of the casino, direct your meditative attention to the space the earth casino occupies. By seeing either holes or the seam where the casino and space meet, by focusing on the space the casino occupies and withdrawing attention from the earth casino, the earth casino is removed. The manner in which the earth casino leaves the space is not something to which you pay any attention. Have confidence that when space is effectively taken as a meditative object, the earth casino is not present. The important aspect at this point of the mission is that the earth casino is leaving the space it formerly occupied. Next, direct the subtle awareness of space to its full vastness. This entire all-encompassing space holds the infinite units, including you. When the jhana factors of Egagata and Upeka are strong and the bright jhana energy is sufficiently concentrated, awareness focuses on a small spot in the unexpanded space. There is a spot that for some reason draws the attention quite naturally and easily. This small spot and field of space then becomes the meditative object. With sufficient time meditating on the attention spot in the field of unending space, awareness is drawn into full absorption in the base of boundless space, the fifth jhana. The base of boundless space is the source of unending, unbounded, unlimited space in an immaterial realm. The experience of absorption into the base of boundless space is quite exquisite and qual um, and quality qualitatively far more refined than the fourth jhana of space casino. In this space, this is the space in which all objects in the material realm appear. Perhaps we can conceptually liken it to the canvas of life on which each brush stroke of life appears. It is a very profound experience. As with the other jhanas, achieve the five masters of this jhana before moving to the base of boundless consciousness. The sixth jhana as a jhana mastery includes one meditative period of three continuous hours of uninterrupted absorption in the base of boundless space. This is likely to take several attempts before the time trees achieve. The immaterial jhanas are a pure energy in the material jhanas. The refinement and purification of mind in the upper jhanas is very intense experience. Until this purification is complete at the level of the base of boundless space, you will not be able to access the base of boundless con. When the five jhana masteries have been attained in the base in the base of boundless space, you can proceed to attempt access to the base of boundless consciousness. The base of boundless consciousness, the sixth jhana, proceeding from the base of either jhana pananima the white casina. Take Earth Casina as the meditator and enter the first, second, third using Earth Casina as an expand Earth Casina as before to encompass the entire. At this point, the jhana factors of Egagata, one point in Upeka, are present, as is in the fourth jhana and all the immaterial jhana. As before, direct the meditative into the space the Earth Casina occupies, either by seeing tiny holes in the earth or by focusing on the edge where it meets space. Remove the earth casino and the new object, the base of boundless space arises. 
Once again, take boundless space as a meditative object. Meditate upon the awareness of unending and its full boundlessness and vastness. Next, allow the meditative attention to be drawn to a particular small pot, spot in boundless space. When meditative concentration, upeka and egagata are of sufficient strength, awareness becomes full space, the fifth jhana. Direct attention to the consciousness that holds boundless space as an object. An object such as the consciousness of boundless space is very difficult to speak about or imagine as a concept. Once the absorption into the base of boundless space, the fifth jhana has occurred. Taking the consciousness of boundless space as a meditative object is subtle, yet apparent and somehow possible. Naturally, the universal awareness that holds unending space as its object is a very subtle object itself, while also being very refined. When a meditator is at this point in the jhana practice, the consciousness of boundless space can indeed be taken as an object. Take the consciousness that holds the base of boundless space as an object. The consciousness holding this object is by its nature infinite. As before in the fifth jhana, this consciousness holding boundless space is stabilized during meditation. The jhana factors Zagagata and Upeka are held until they are of the necessary strength. Once the consciousness holding boundless unending space is known as the meditative object, and Egagata and Upeka are strong, the attention con can hold the entirety of this consciousness. Concentration and one-pointedness deepen and stabilize on this extremely subtle meditative object. When ripe, awareness is drawn into full absorption in the base of boundless consciousness, the sixth jhana. This boundless, unending consciousness contains the infinite, infinite space that ultimately contains all material. This is the consciousness of the totality. Everything is contained within the one consciousness here, and this one consciousness pervades everywhere endlessly. It is an undivided wholeness. The purification of mind facilitated by full absorption into the base of boundless consciousness that holds all space is profound. As with the prior jhanas, the five jhana masteries must be attained in the base of boundless consciousness before it's, it is completed. Once you have completed all five masteries in the sixth jhana, including a single three-hour uninterrupted absorption in the base of boundless consciousness, proceed to the base of nothingness. Base of nothingness, the seventh jhana. The object for the base of nothingness is the absence of the consciousness of boundless space. So, in effect, the new object is the absence of the object used for the sixth jhana. Go through the first four jhanas using earth casina. If earth casina is difficult to take as a meditative object, begin with white casina and follow the proper steps to establish each as using the white casina as an object. Remain in each of the first four jhanas using white casina as an object until stable. If you can easily see earth casino with eyes closed, then proceed accordingly through the first four jhanas using earth casino as an object. Remain in the four lower jhanas in earth casino only long enough to establish stability, perhaps five to ten minutes each. Then re-establish the base of boundless space by removing the earth casino and entering absorption here. Again, take the consciousness of the fifth jhana, the base of boundless space, as an object, and allow full absorption to the sixth jhana to arise. Stay in the sixth jhana long enough to reach stability. Stability in the immaterial jhanas takes longer than in the lower four jhanas as the upper jhanas are much more refined. When you are stable in the base of boundless consciousness, take up the base of nothingness by focusing on the absence of the consciousness of boundless space. Two mind moments do not arise simultaneously. When the consciousness of the base of boundless space is present, the base of boundless consciousness is absent. And when the base of boundless consciousness is present, then the consciousness of the base of boundless space is absent. That abs absence of consciousness is the base of boundless space is used as the arc for the seventh jhana. The nothingness of this immaterial state, the seventh jhana, is complete, unending, Emptiness is a rich fullness of no identity, no thing. It is no thingness. Usually with forms such as thoughts, people, and objects, there are many ways that we mark the forms with identity. We can have a certain feeling about a relation, about or relationship to a particular form. 
in the base of nothingness, all sense of any form or structure, as well as any markers of any are gone. This is a dramatic shift. The base of boundless consciousness is a fullness that contains the immensity of infinite space, which ultimately holds all materiality. In contrast, the base of nothingness, nothingness is the utter void, the dazzling darkness. This is not an unpleasant jhana. There is a sense of pristine purity or despite being no thingness there is a sense of presence a deep still still pervasive it is the experience of no thing from which all materiality consciousness and space can arise and be supported when the absence of consciousness of the fifth jhana of boundless space can be held it becomes the meditative object this may require many attempts as the object is so fine it can slip away this is an object that is delicately held, like holding gauze up to the sky. When ready, the object becomes stable, and attention focuses on a particular spot within this nothingness. The spot is not actually within nothingness. It is within the heart base. This is a technical specification that the beginning meditator need not understand. However, the perception of a specific location in primordial nothingness allows awareness to attentively rest and eventually be observed. Once awareness is deeply concentrated on the absence of the consciousness of boundless space and the jhana factors of Ekagata and Upekar are strongly present, awareness is drawn into full absorption in this state. As with the prior jhanas, continue with this jhana until the five jhana masteries have been including a single three-hour uninterrupted absorption in this jhana. With each of the immaterial jhanas, a tremendous amount of purification occurs. The meditator's mind stream is directly entering and being suffused by the no-thingness from which boundless consciousness arises. For awareness to be fully absorbed in these realms, beyond access concentration, is indescribable. There are sublime realms unimaginable to the thinking mind. Until these immaterial states are deeply known experientially, the student must take their existence on faith in the Buddha and the jhana teachers. After attaining the five jhana masteries in the base of nothingness, you are ready for the next immaterial jhana, the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Base of neither perception nor non-perception, the eighth jhana. Take Earth Casina as the meditative object. If Earth Casina is difficult to begin with as a meditative object, start with White Casina. Develop White Casina as before through the first four jhanas using White Casina as an object until stable in each. When you can take Earth Casina as a meditative jhana, when stable in first jhana, to enter second jhana, Earth Casina is object. As stabil stability is obtained in second jhana, third jhana, jhana. After achieving stability in fourth jhana, you earth casina. Go through the process of being earth casina as the again focus on either minute holes in earth casina or the earth casina. As before, remove earth casina. It takes space that earth casina formerly occupied. When the jhana factors of Vekagong shift attention to a small spot on the space and focus on is drawn into the base of boundless space. The consciousness holding the base of boundless space will become stable as a meditator, and the jhana fast of Ekagata and Upeka will become strong. When ripe, awareness is drawn into fulsion in the sixth jhana, the base of boundless consciousness. Upon exiting the sixth jhana, take the absence of the consciousness of the base of boundless space as the meditative. Hold the absence of the consciousness of base of boundless space as the meditative object until the jhana factors of Egagaka become strong. When concentration is up, the base of nothingness draws awareness into full absorption in the seventh jhana. Upon exiting the seventh jhana, proceed towards the eighth jhana, the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Now take the consciousness of the base of nothingness as the meditative object. Shift attention away from the base of nothingness and focus on the consciousness holding nothing. This consciousness of is the container in which nothingness is held. This is an even finer gauze-like object. To hold an object as subtle and fine as this, the sense of me must be almost completely transparent. Taking the consciousness of the base of nothingness as meditative object is like holding a spider web to the sky. It is a very del delicate, exquisitely fragile object of awareness. Only a purified, jhana-energized awareness can hold the object of the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Take the consciousness of the base of nothingness as a meditative object. 
With time, the jhana factors of Egagata and Upekka become strong. With prolonged meditation, awareness is eventually drawn into the full absorption in the base of neither perception or non-perception, the eighth jhana. This jhana cannot begin to be imagined or conceptualized. While being outside perception and non-perception, this realm contains both and neither at the same time. It is a direct experience of non-dual awareness. There is neither perception nor non-perception in this immaterial realm. This immaterial state is beyond a sense of mentality. The normal thinking mind absolutely cannot grasp it. Thinking cannot be present here, nor even in access concentration. If it arises, the base of neither perception or non-perception wafts away like a wisp of smoke. The first time each of us experienced this realm, it was unimaginably spectacular for Tina. It was so intense that she could only, or she could tolerate only a few minutes the first few times before awareness settled, and there was a complete sen surrender to its purification and subtlety. Stephen was knocked out of the jhana after about one half hours. His awareness could not have remained the base of neither perception nor non-perception one second longer at that time. This was less than was needed for jhana mastery. Yet even the first experience of this jhana was akin to being completely re reborn as a new innocent. Once the five jhana masteries are attained, including one uninterrupted meditative period of three hours, the eighth jhana is complete. Proceed to the other casinas. Order of casinas through the immaterial jhanas. The casinas in the immaterial jhanas are completed in the following order. Earth casino, water casino. Fire Casina, Wind Casina, Nila Casina, Yellow Casina, Red Casina, 8 White Casina, 9 Light Casina. Take up the remaining 8 Casinas, space, ca space Casina is excluded as the object of entry into the 4 Immaterial Jhanas. Use each Casina as the object through the 4 Immaterial Jhanas. Progressing through the 4 Immaterial Jhanas of the base of boundless space, the ba base of boundless consciousness, the base of nothingness, and the base of neither perception nor non-perception, achieve the 5 Jhana Masteries with each of the Immaterial Jhanas through each Casina, including one meditation period of 3 hours in each immaterial jhana with each casino. Begin by taking the casino as an object into first jhana. Do this as quickly as the jhana can be stabilized using that casino as the object. Then take the specific casino through the second, third, and fourth jhanas, also one at a time. As before, upon exiting jhana, check the bhavanga with the wisdom eye to confirm that the requisite jhana factors are present. You can move through each lower jhana in a matter of a few minutes. Once all lower jhanas are completed with the specific casino, access each upper jhana as described with earth casino. Complete the first four jhanas using the particular casino, and then either see titles in the casino or focus on the edge where the katina, casino touches space. Then remove the casino to reveal the space that holds it as the base of boundless space. Per Proceed as previously described through the four upper jhanas. The element, earth, water, fire, and air, are completed first to purify and lose your connection to the element in your body and all materiality. Then the color casinas are completed, purifying your attachment to bodily colors. This, too, is done to refine your consciousness for the light casino, which is the most refined of the casinas in the immaterial jhanas. Using the light casino as an entry point leading to the delicacy of the eighth jhana of neither perception or non-perception is an exquisitely refined and subtle experience. The purification that occurs in the imperial upper jhanas is delicate, yet very concentrated and intense. You must be willing to allow the pure to penetrate your entire. We can attest that when the five jhana masteries are attained, using the final light casino and completing the final jhana of the base of neither perception or non perception, there is a deep and profound knowing of never being the same person again. The purification continues working on us and later manifests in our lives in un unexpected ways that change our beliefs, opinions, habits, and behavior. More important, this practice has altered the ongoing exper experiential awareness of the manifestation of all that we see from our own body, mind, to the material world around us. 
Even now, years later, we can experience at any moment the profundity of awareness as it is experienced in the eighth jhana. There is an ongoing perception that all materiality manifests from the mass mystery of the unconditioned down through the immaterial realms into material realm and eventually appearing materiality as the words on the in your perception of as the breath that we are breathing as we write these words even when the daily experience of jhana absorption is past this visceral knowing reads affecting and informing each moment of experience and its relationship to the mystery we have now traversed the most delicate of meditation with this very pristine refined concentration and purification as a foundation we next move into the protective meditation which prepare the meditator to eventually undertake vipassana practice chapter seven the sublime abidings and protective meditations when you have completed the jhana progression through the eighth jhana the next stage of practice is to complete the sublime abidings and protective meditations the four sublime ab abidings brahma viharas consist of the following meditation subjects metta or loving kindness karuna compassion three mudita joy four upeka equanimity the four protective meditations consist of the following meditation subjects metta loving kindness recollection of the buddha foulness meditation and recollection of death the primary purpose of all these practices is to provide a solid base of support as the meditator progresses towards the insight practice of vipassana because the insights that arise in vipassana are deeply uprooting to the sense of self and of materiality materiality and mentality as they have been previously known the experience can be destabilizing for a person's sense of me the protective meditations serve various purposes in stabilizing the meditator's practice and encouraging him or her to proceed in the face of this destabilization the conflict between the world as we conceptually know it and the realization of things as they truly are the sublime abidings provide a sense of well-being to clear the meditator's karma with others and build the equanimity necessary for the uprooting and releasing that happens in vipassana the recollection of the buddha provides inspiration and a direct feeling of connection to the buddha as one who has completed this practice to its full fruition and whose teachings have guided millions of practitioners throughout the through through the ages the foundness meditation meditation on a corpse softens the meditator's attachment to him or herself as the body the recollection of death simul stimulates a sense of urgency regarding practice it shows that there is no time to waste in realizing the truth because we never know when this life may end though these may sound very traditional to modern practitioners they are well worth doing and offer us a variety of benefits as a foundation for vipassana and may even be returned to as necessary during the vipassana practice a secondary purpose of these practices is to continue deepening the faculty of concentration by providing additional meditation objects that can lead to various levels of concentration with each of the above meditation subjects the venerable paoxai now asks his students to obtain the following level of concentration metta loving kindness third jhana karuna compassion third jhana mudita joy third jhana upeka equanimity fourth jhana Recollection of the Buddha, access concentration. Foundness meditation, first jhana. Recollection of death, access concentration. The first three sublime abidings are available only up to the third jhana because they have an intrinsic sense of joy and happiness that is not present in the fourth jhana. Upeka, equanimity, can be used as a medita meditative subject up to the fourth jhana because the remaining jhana factors in the fourth jhana are one pointedness and equanimity these four objects of the sublime these four objects of the sublime abidings build on one another sequentially beginning with metta so the culmination of this practice is the fourth jhana in the practice of upeka equanimity with the additional three protective meditations beyond metta only access concentration or first john is possible for this reason the Sai Dao encourages students to spend just one or two hours on this practice at a time so as not to dissipate the high concentration of the jhanas while completing these practices you must continue jhana meditation for one sitting per day 
completing up to the eighth jhana. This ensures that the intensive jhana level concentration is available for use with these and other practices and does not dissipate over time. Each of these practices is done by beginning with the Anapana Nimitta or White Casina as the object up to the fourth jhana. Because you've already completed a long period of time with the material and immaterial jhanas using the Anapana Nimitta and the Casina as, as primary objects, this is easy to do. Establishment of a minimum of the fourth jhana using your ongoing base meditation object of the Anapana Nimitta or White Casina before beginning the sublime abidings and pre protective meditations ensures that you have powerful concentration at the start and makes it easier to establish the highest possible level of concentration on these new subjects. Details of these meditation practices are outlined thoroughly in the Venerable Pax Ayanao's book, Knowing and Seeing, and thus will not be presented here. The sublime abidings, the Brahma Viharas, are taught widely in North America and Europe, and the Venerable Pax Ayanao's instructions in the practice is similar but with some variation. One of the Once the practitioner has completed the sublime abidings and protective meditations, she or he is ready to proceed to the four elements meditation and move toward the beginning of Vipassana practice. End of chapter seven. Chapter eight, the four elements meditation. Four elements meditation is a critical practice to develop well. As all students of the Vinopa Oxide Al must develop this meditation to undertake the Vipassana portion of the Buddhist path. In this practice, we experientially learn and know that all that appears real, including our own bodies, is comprised of a combination of the four elements. The belief in and attachment to a body becomes difficult to sustain after this practice is thoroughly experienced. There are two ways in which a student undertakes the Four Elements Meditation. For those who have completed the practices outlined in this book, the Four Ele Elements Meditation is the next practice in the Samatha sequence. Those students who can attain jhana using the Anapana, um, Anapana Sati Meditation take up to four take up four elements meditation after the sublime abidings and protective meditations discussed in the preceding chapter. The sublime abidings and protective meditations are undertaken to allow greater ease in facing the rigors of the Kalapa practice that are experienced as a result of the four elements meditation. The four elements meditation then serves as the bridge that completes the Samatha practices and begins the Vipassana practice. Practitioners completing the Samatha portion, as outlined in this book, would be considered Samatha yogis. The Venerable Pahak Saido indicates that if someone finds, after exhausted effort, that she or he cannot progress through the jhanas beginning with Anapanasati meditation, the student may be directed to try four elements meditation. This is why our practice chart reflects the four elements meditation as an alternative beginning point to Anapanasati meditation. These practitioners would be considered Vipassana yogis or dry insight yogis as they are proceeding directly to the Vipassana practice. The four elements meditation allows you to experience your body as being composed entirely of a blend of the four elements. It is not possible to attain jhana using the four elements as an object as they are objects of momentary concentration. However, four elements meditation can lead to access concentration. Four elements meditation in its later application is used to used to dis directly discern, see, and analyze rupa kalapas. Rupa kalapas are the tiny subatomic particles that make up all objects in the world of materiality. We will not discuss using four elements meditation beyond the point of seeing kalapas because that is the end of the samatha practice, which is the focus of this book. Four elements meditation instructions. The four elements are earth, water, fire, and air with their associated characteristics. Earth element, hardness, roughness, heaviness, softness, smoothness, lightness, water element, flowing, cohesion, fire element, heat, coldness, air element, supporting, pushing. Pairing each element with its opposite allows an easier initial progression through the characteristics of each of the four elements. After learning the pairs in this way, you should then complete the four elements meditation in the traditional order. We present the characteristics below in an order that we believe is easier to learn. The progression is recommended. The progression we recommend first is one hardness and softness, or hardness softness. Two roughness smoothness. Three heaviness lightness. Four 
flowing, cohesion. Five, heat, cold. Six, supporting, pushing. To begin the four elements practice, if you have previously completed the jhana practice, you should use white casina as an object to progress through the first, second, third, fourth, and fourth jhanas. If you have not completed the jhana practice, you can proceed to start the four element, elements meditation directly. In either case, begin by seeking all hardness in your body. Examples of hardness are teeth, bones, and nails. Experientially, locate each area of hardness in your body. When you can find an and simultaneously hold all areas of hardness in your body without division or distraction. Begin searching your body for softness, ignoring hardness entirely at, that, at, the, at this time. Softness is everything that is not hardness. Literally, your experience in the body during this pairing is, neither, is either of hardness or so, of softness when eval, evaluating just these two characteristics of earth of element. If you can easily hold hardness, you can shift your attention to everywhere else in your body to find all that is softness. Then alternate between hardness and softness until you can discern and feel each in literally an instant. Then hold hardness and softness, softness distinctly and simultaneously. Next, examine the characteristics of rough, roughness and smoothness. An example of roughness might be the tough skin on the bottom of your feet. Discover and experience all roughness in your body until you can feel it at once everywhere. If you can find you can find smoothness by running your tongue over your lips, as in one example, the tongue also feels quite smooth on the teeth. Sleek smoothness everywhere in your body. I'm sorry, seek smoothness everywhere in your body then alternate between roughness and smoothness when you can find roughness roughness and smoothness quickly both separately and simultaneously advance to heaviness and lightness you can feel heaviness where the bottom of your where the bottom of your body that is legs feet or buttocks touches the meditation cushion chair floor once you can know this everywhere in your body at once shift your meditative awareness to lightness. One example of how lightness might be experienced is the hair on your arms. Continue to explore your body, searching everywhere for lightness. When you can clearly sense lightness and heaviness throughout the body, sense them by quickly shifting from one to the other. Hold heaviness and lightness simultaneously and distinctly. Flowing and cohesion, flowing and cohesion are next. the next characteristics to look for in your body. You can sense flowing as the blood or other liquids moving through your body, for example. Detect all areas of flowing in the body. Feel each area flowing at once before moving to cohesion. Cohesion is felt as how the body holds itself together. The various muscles, blood vessels, and organs remarkably stay within the skin of this body. Feel cohesion everywhere in the body at once, then alternate between flowing and cohesion. When you can experience each of these completely in one instant, shift to feeling both of these together distinctly and simultaneously. Heat and cold need no explanation. It's fairly easy to find these characteristics in your body. Again, experience these by alternating one and then the other. Supporting and pushing are a little tricky to find. Supporting is how the various organs are held in place by their location and other factors you discover. Likewise, you can feel pushing when your breath is drawn into your body with deep deliberation. The wind pushes into your lungs, expanding the chest, allowing your body to breathe. Explore the body to find every area of supporting. Then, once all areas of supporting are found, shift attention to pushing, locating all places of pushing in the body. As you clearly discern these and learn to know them deeply, alternate attention from supporting to pushing and back again. Feel each characteristic as completely distinct from the other characteristics and then discern, discern them simultaneously. Once you can easily identify each characteristic in each of the four elements, proceed to locating these characteristics in the traditionally prescribed order. Order of characteristics of each element as in the traditional instructions. After you have learned all the characteristics in the above order, begin to locate the characteristics of each element in the following order as is done traditionally. Again, the order of the traditional instructions is earth element, hardness, roughness, heaviness, softness, smoothness, lightness. Water element, flowing, cohesion, 
fire element heat cold air element supporting pushing once you have sufficiently experienced all the characteristics separately experience each group as an entire element for instance the characteristics of water element are flowing in cohesion once you have learned these separately sense them simultaneously in the body holding them as the water element when you can experience each characteristic for each element cycle through each element feeling all its characteristics separately at once when you can hold each element with all its characteristics proceed to run through the elements in order of earth water fire and air when you can distinctly feel each element in the body cycle through all the elements to the point where you can do three complete complete rounds of all the elements in a minute with each element being distinctly experienced when you are li you are likely to experience the body as a combination of these elements not as a distinct body there is no part of the body that does not reflect one characteristic of an element there comes a time when you can hold each element with its distinctness with all the other elements at once the venerable pa Oxidao then instructed us to use the wisdom eye to obtain a vantage point just above and behind the body as if we were looking slightly down on our own body from right above and in back of the head with continued deep meditation of the four elements there develops a light a kind of glow around the body do not shift your meditative attention to the glow but allow it to develop on its own in our experience at this point was of seeing the entire body and its four elements as a white cloud-like form despite the white cloud-like form continue to maintain meditative attention cycling through the four elements over time this white form becomes begins to become crystal-like the white form transmutes into a perceived crystal body your crystal body over time the crystal body becomes brilliant in its glow and is perceived as diamond hard this diamond like body begins to glow with a brilliant light which expands in every direction you can see the emanating light during meditation at this time the brilliant crystal body feels very clear and pure as with many aspects of these practices we were not sure what would happen when we started or what to expect but by staying true to the practice and maintaining awareness on the object the practice did progress as described variations on how and when to do this practice in stephen's case because of physical issues he undertook four elements meditation at the beginning before going on to the anapanasati practice you can use the four elements meditation to balance the four elements and characteristics should they be out of balance for example a meditator might seek softness or flowing in a part of the body that is stiff and painful for stephen during four elements meditation first enabled his bodily energies to smooth out before undertaking the anapanasati meditation as mentioned earlier in most cases the teacher will encourage students to do the anapana sati meditation first and if they are not successful to then proceed to the four elements practice in tina's case she completed the practices in the sequence given by the venerable pa oxido in his book knowing and seeing if you're doing the four elements meditation in this way that is after having completed all the jhanas casinas related practice and, pr and protective meditation meditations you should also continue continue practicing the jhanas up to the eighth jhana during one meditation period per day each day to maintain a high level of jhana concentration if you have completed fourth jhana or even first jhana continue to do one sitting per, per day up to the highest jhana obtained to maintain concentration this makes for a powerful entry into beginning the vipassana, the vipassana practice starting with the four elements meditation it ensures that the concentration developed over the many days weeks and months of practice is sustained and available to use the vipassana portion of the buddhist path the four elements meditation is very different from jhana practice in that it is fast moving and requires the use of momentary concentration rather than absorption you will not experience absorption in doing the four elements meditation rather you use momentary Terry concentration to develop a high level of access concentration practicing the jhanas 
at one sitting per day allows for a high level of concentration. Then you can switch to doing the four elements meditation practice for the rest of the day. Rupa Kalapas. Toward the, towards the end of the retreat with Venerable Pahak Sayadaw, after spending some days on the four elements meditation and progressing to the crystal body, Tina started perceiving a vib vibrating sensation internally during meditation with eyes closed and externally with eyes open while moving around. This is common once the perception of the crystal body becomes stable, and it is seen in block form for at least 30 consecutive minutes of access concentration. At this point, the meditator is instructed to look for the space element in the transparent form of the crystal body. As this practice progresses, the crystal body can suddenly break down into small particles called rupa kalapas, which are the subatomic particles of materiality that comprise all matter. Seeing rupa kalapas is the final stage of samatha practice before you begin analyzing the rupa kalapas. Analyzing Rupa Kalapas is the first stage of Vipassana practice according to Buddha's teachings as presented by the Venerable Pahak Sayadaw. In Tina's experience, seeing Rupa Kalapas had a significant and permanent impact on her perception of materiality slash physical reality. Having a direct experience of seeing everything one looks at, including one's own body, as moving subatomic particles alters the perception of me and of the substantiality of what we regard as normal reality. Stephen experienced a moment, a brief flash of seeing Rupa Kalapas. Due to the limited duration of his experience, it had less of an impact. It is useful to remember that the Samatha portion of the Buddhist path is tradi traditionally described as the purification of mind, while the Vipassana portion is described as the purification of view. The internal purifications of one's mind stream, uh, the, the internal purification of one's mind stream lays the groundwork for purifying the internal and external view of reality as we come to know it as it actually is rather than as the conditioned mind has taken it to be. Seeing and later analyzing Rupa Kalapas is the beginning of seeing materiality as it actually is without the overlay of conceptual thought. This completes the Samatha meditations we learned under the guidance of the Venerable Pahak Sayadaw. Your experience may be slightly different from ours given the unique nature of the solitary journey upon which we embark in the purifi purification of mind offered by these ancient practices. Chapter 9 the Buddha as our role model. We began this book by describing the context of the jhanas as they were learned, practiced, and taught by the Buddha. It is appropriate that we end with this context as well. Modern practitioners sometimes wonder whether the jhanas are necessary. Are they still an important or even essential aspect of practice? Are they an extraneous form of meditation, not only unnecessary, but also beyond the reach of most people? Meditators have debated these questions for thousands of years and are unlikely to resolve them soon, if ever. Thus, each of us needs to determine the answer to these questions for ourselves. For us, the answer lies in the practice of the Buddha himself. If he is our role model, should we... If he is a role model, should we not follow the path that he not only taught but personally practiced throughout his life, even at the moment of death? By following the Buddha's ingenious design and role modeling of the path of sila, ethics, samatha, concentration practice, and vipassana insight, we planned we plant the seeds for an ever depending, ever deepening purification of mind within which the wisdom of liberation can flower. May you experientially know each step in the footprints of the Buddha on your path to realizing liberation. Epilogue. Uh, in 1934, the boy uh, Asina, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that wrong, A-C-I-N-N-A, -N -N -A, was born in Li Chaung village, about 100 miles northwest of Yang, Yangon, Myanmar, Burma. At the age of 10, he was ordained as a novice, a Samanera, in the Theravada Buddhist tradition in his village. Later, at the age of 20, he was ordained as a full-fledged monk, a bhikkhu. As a Samanera and as a bhikkhu, he was trained under the guidance of learned elder monks, completing the prestigious Dhamma Jiriya examination in 1954, the equivalent of a master's degree in Buddhist Pali studies. 
for the next eight years, he traveled throughout Myanmar and Burma to learn from various well-known Buddhist teachers. In 1964, he began forest dwelling, living a life of renunciation dedicated to spiritual practice in the forest or jungle. In order to intensify his meditation practice for the next 16 years, he made forest dwelling his primary practice, living a simple life of intensive meditation and scriptural study. In 1981, the Viral Sanina uh, received a message from the Venerable Agapana, the abbot of Pa'ak Forest Monastery at the time. The Venerable Agapana was dying and asked the Venerable Asina to look after the monastery. Five days later, the Venerable Agapana died, and the Venerable Asina became known as the Venerable Pa'ak Taya Saida, the new abbot. Although he oversaw monastery operations, he spent most of his time in seclusion, meditating in a bamboo hut in the upper forest of the monastery grounds. Four meditators began arriving at the monastery in the early 90s as the Saidao's reputation grew as a highly attained meditator and an English-speaking abbot. In 1997, the Venerable Pa'ak Saidao wrote his magnum opus, the enormous five-volume tome in Burmese titled, The Practice That Leads to Nibbana explaining the entire course of the Buddha's teachings in detail, supported by copious quotations from the text in Pali, in which he is fluent. In 1999, in public recognition of his achievements, the government of Myanmar, Burma, bestowed upon him the title of highly respected meditation teacher. In 1999, the Venerable Pak wrote Knowing and Seeing, available in English, which is a condensed 350-page version of this path of practice, including extensive instructions on the material and immaterial jhanas. The monastery has since, been, has since expanded to more than 800 full-time monastic and lay practitioners, four meditation halls, a library, a clinic, a hospital, and an almsgiving hall. The population sometimes now exceeds 1,500 people during festivals. Meanwhile, in the United States in 1976, Four American friends established the Insight Meditation Society in Bear, Massachusetts. After studying Theravada Buddhism in Southeast Asia, Joseph Goldstein, Jack Kornfield, Sharon Salzberg, and Jacqueline Schwartz studied with numerous teachers and brought these teachings primarily focusing on insight meditation in the lineage of the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw back to the West. Since they were sometimes of the first since they were some of the first Americans teaching Buddhism, the spread of the practice was gradual and sometimes slow. But with persistence and dedication, the Sangha grew. In 1981, the Venerable Mahasi Saido, a well-known and respected Buddhist teacher, came to IMS to officially certify the center as an insight meditation center in his tradition. In 1987, Jack Cornfield directed the purchase of the land for Spirit Rock Retreat Center in Woodacre, California. Together, Spirit Rock and IMS host tens of thousands of meditators annually, some completing retreats as long as two or three months. IMS and Spirit Rock continued to host the most respected Asian Theravada teachers, including the Venerable Pa'ak Saidao and many others. At the writing of this book, the Venerable Pa'ak Saidao is more than 70 years old. He is now considered by many to be the leading Asian master teaching jhana practices, in addition to the insight practices of Vipassana. Now is the time to learn this ancient and worthy practice before it is, too, is lost to obscurity. When the Saidao was young, his teacher charged him with planting the seeds of the Buddha's teaching in the West. Despite his advancing age, he continues to travel around the world to offer these teachings, preserving them and passing them on.